us, those who are in the audience and those who are joining us uh, remotely. At this time, like with every meeting, we typically start with an invocation. And uh, Council Member Harris, I see you moving your mic. You want to go talk to the Lord for us? Yeah. And I've been talking all the time. But you know, I did ask a, a slight question to Council Member Green and asked her if she would like to do the invocation. And she oh, said God, yes. Okay. That's wonderful. Make sure you pray for that chance. sweater he got on in there. <laughs> All right, immediately following the prayer, if we could uh, repeat the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today in praise, Lord. We always want you to know that we lift you on high more than anything that would ever be on this earth. Thank you for allowing us to be in a country, in a state, in a city where we can discuss openly our faith, our religion, and our government all in one breath. Lord, we thank you for your overseeing this meeting today. We ask that you keep us ever mindful of the task in front of us, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that your hand be on the elections tomorrow, keep peace and calm, and that the peace would be coming from you, Lord, and the peace that only we as believers understand, Lord, that peace that passeth all understanding. And, Lord, we help us ever be mindful also, Lord, that whoever is in the office, that you are still on the throne. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councilwoman Green. Great prayer. Um, Councilor, as we move to the next item, uh, city manager's report, Mr. Hewitt. Yes, sir. Ask um, Assistant Manager Yates to come forward just for a brief introduction of someone to council. Good afternoon, Assistant Manager. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Mr. Hewitt. I just want to be a quick introduction. We have um, Dr. Watkins and MK Gamble with us from, if you could stand up and wave. They are from the Science Policy Action Network, Inc. They are going to lead our effort um, with city staff and putting together a proposed and recommended framework for the SRO agreements. As you guys talked about um, in your different work sessions, looking at the SRO agreements as a holistic approach, looking at all the different variables that go there, whether that's community needs, social workers in the schools, so forth. So they're gonna lead that effort um, in getting, gathering input from both the community, the sheriff's office, our police department, the schools, um, and you as the council as to what we're looking for. So you'll see more of them over the next 90 days or so as we were kind of work through that. And they'll be back, I believe, on the 18th for a more in-depth discussion of what that process looks like. So I just want to introduce them for you. Thank you, Mr. Yates. Thank you. Welcome, uh, you guys. Uh, Council, any questions, comments on that? Council Member here. Uh, no, sir, Mayor. But just wanted to make a little slight announcement that I've had uh, some death in my family, so I will be leaving this weekend. There's a good possibility that I may not be back Monday. Sorry to hear about uh, that. We're going to D.C., so Justin, yes, so sir. it can be stated that in the record of where right. I am. Got you, sir. Right. Sorry to Thank hear about you, that. Keep yes, you and your family in our prayers, and as well as the other council members uh, that have recently lost uh, family members. All right, council, as we move to 5.0, the agenda approval, can we have a motion? We'll go on our short mics. All right, so I know the first one was verbal, but I heard council member Harris seconded by Hondros, and then we'll go to the shirt system after that. Uh, any discussion on the motion to approve? All right, Council, I'll look to you for your votes on that. All right, motion carries. Uh, and moving to the next item as we go to 6.01, the Driving Equity Laws update. Uh, Councilman Benavente. Thank you, Mayor Colvin. Um, I believe we've got a, a few presenters that uh, can feel free to approach the podium and, and get themselves ready to present. Um, when we last connected about this issue at our last work session, uh, we discussed bringing in some uh, folks who have had success in addressing issue uh, that has uh, been a problem for Fayetteville. It's been a problem for a lot of folks, a lot of cities across the state um, and across the country. 
that we are stopping and searching one group of folks uh, more often uh, without much justification. Uh, and we're looking for ways to address that issue that we've all identified as a problem that we want to resolve. Um, so how have other people uh, address this issue? And um, we've got some great feedback from uh, some other city councils um, that have had success. Uh, unfortunately, with the election that's happening tomorrow, I know that they were not able to attend ultimately, um, but we still have the policy experts that uh, worked with them and led them to that point. Um, so we have Ms. Kat Kerwin, who I believe is going to introduce herself um, and uh, her partner as well. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and turn the microphone over to them. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me? Is this on? Yes. Okay. Is it possible for the slide deck to be projected? Okay. Thank you so much. Um, bear with me here. Okay. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to C Councilman Benavante for having us and uh, to the full body for allowing us this time. Uh, my name is Kat Kerwin. Uh, I am an attorney. Uh, I am a former city council member. Um, I served on the Providence, Rhode Island City Council for four years. And now I am a legal fellow with Local Progress. Uh, local Progress is a network of local elected officials from across the country. Uh, we're about 1,500 elected officials, so mayors, city councilors, town managers, county level officials, uh, working to advance racial and economic justice. And I have spent the past year or so at Local Progress working on a campaign to help municipalities pass laws around driving equality. Um, and so what driving equality means, we'll get into a bit. Um, as I'm presenting this afternoon, please feel free to just like raise your hand, pull me over, uh, stop me whenever. Um, I'm going to kind of give a high level overview of what these laws are. And then my colleague Hamilton Brooks from Vera Institute is going to be talking a little more about the data in Fayetteville and um, kind of offer uh, some information on what's going on on the ground here. So again, Kat Kerwin, just, you know, Stop me if you have questions as I get going. So just a brief introduction. Uh, we know that Americans are about as likely to die as a result of traffic-related violence as gun violence. But compared to gun violence, there's little attention paid to addressing traffic fatalities. And I know that y'all, as local elected officials, know that uh, traffic safety is a real issue. I'm sure you hear about it in your neighborhoods. Um, driving equality laws uh, support local elected officials in pursuing policies that create traffic safety while prioritizing public health and racial equity. And this presentation is going to talk about the ways that Fayetteville can reduce the role of police and traffic enforcement, uh, create physical infrastructure and systems to build real traffic safety, and pursue these uh, solutions uh, in, in uh, at the same time. Uh, so discriminatory use of pretextual stops. Pretextual stops uh, refers to traffic stops where police use the stop as a reason to search for evidence of a crime, so think weapon or drug. Um, and pretextual stops are discriminatory and an ineffective way to create safety or remove weapons and drugs from the streets. We know that less than 1% of stops result in confiscation of firearms, and we know that black and Latino people are more likely to be stopped and searched, but despite the fact that they're not more likely to carry contraband. Traffic stops are ineffective and discriminatory. Uh, data cons consistently shows that there's no significant connection between police making stops uh, for non-safety related traffic violations and reductions in violent crime or car crashes. Instead, the biggest reduction in fatal car crashes over the 20th century was attributed to vehicle technology and shatter resistant windshields. And the re research consistently finds that black and Latino drivers are more likely to be stopped, searched, and subjected to force. Uh, and since 2017, at least 600 people have been killed after being pulled over by police. And 28% of those killed were black drivers, despite the fact that they account for just 13% of the population. 
So we're here with a few policy options. One, reducing pretextual stops. Two, infrastructure improvements. And three, uh, unarmed civilian traffic enforcement. And today we're going to be focusing on reducing pretextual stops. So reducing pretextual stops, what does that mean? Uh, localities across the country have begun efforts to reduce the role of police and vehicle stops and deprioritize low-level traffic violations. So those are those traffic violations that are non-safety related. Uh, we have a council member in Philadelphia, Isaiah Thomas, who's been a leader on this issue. Um, and he passed a law just over two years ago called the Driving Equality Plan. And it has two pieces. The first piece being a policy bill, which uh, kind of names eight non-safety related traffic offenses as no longer being eligible to serve as the primary reason for a stop. And then the second piece of the bill being a data collection uh, component, which you know recognizes that we can't uh, create policy around something that we're not studying. So. Uh, it requires police to collect relevant data on types, certain uh, types of stops, uh, including the race of the driver, the reason for the stop, and whether there was a warning or citation or arrest that took place, and then publish that data. Uh, and a similar policy uh, was in place in Fayetteville from 2013 to 2017. It was a departmental policy, though, and it was not codified, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So the driving uh, equity plan, uh, again, this was passed by council member Isaiah Thomas in Philadelphia. And I said that there were eight non-safety related offenses that it kind of outlined as no longer uh, eligible to serve as the basis for a stop. And, you know, when I say non-safety related, these things are really like not, you know, what we think of as being dangerous driving issues. It's people that are maybe driving with a late registration or a temporary registration or one headlight is out. It's stuff that, you know, isn't actually uh, making someone dangerous on the road, but instead is kind of like logistical concerns. And, you know, the policy named these eight uh, offenses and said they can no longer be the basis for a stop. And instead, um, you know, something safety related can continue to be the basis. So you think running a red light, running a stop sign, things like that could still uh, you know, police could still pull someone over for those sorts of things. So the impact of that law. Um, in the first few years since that law was implemented, traffic stops went down 54% in the areas um, in which I just mentioned. And while stops for those minor violations decreased, stops for more dangerous violations, so those, you know, running a stop sign or a red light, uh, increased. Um, and other localities, including Pittsburgh, Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, Shaker Heights, Ohio, Seattle, LA, have also taken stops um, or taken steps to reduce pretextual stops by implementing similar policies. And some state, I, I should say, some states have also taken similar action. So, driving equality policies in Fayetteville and North Carolina more broadly. So as I mentioned kind of briefly, in 2013, Fayetteville became one of the first police departments in the country to reprioritize traffic stops. Um, so similar model to Philadelphia there, uh, de-emphasizing certain traffic stops. Um, and when the policy was rescinded after Chief Medlock retired, um, you know, this was no longer, um, the policy was rescinded, and we saw uh, racial disparities in traffic stops increase, which is something we'll get into a little bit with Hamilton. But yeah, so we can see that Fayetteville was actually a leader, leader on this for many years. Um, and we can see that because the policy wasn't codified, uh, we began to see you know those same racial disparities and traffic stops continue after the policy was rescinded. Um, and there are a few other jurisdictions across the country, or I'm sorry, across Carolina that have similar driving equality policies. Um, Chapel Hill has a pretextual stop ordinance that's very similar to the Philadelphia model. Um, Mecklenburg County uh, has a law enforcement directed policy, so an internal policy, as does uh, Kerberough. So, you know, this is something that we're not only seeing across the country, but we're also seeing right here in North Carolina. And it's something that even Fayetteville has done before. 
And I just want to make a quick note on right-sizing the pro uh, approach. So while Philadelphia's law is really the model and they um, enumerated those eight non-safety related offenses, um, you know, Fayetteville can kind of right-size the approach. We can pick and choose what works best for your neighbors, what works best for this community. Um, for example, uh, you can look at late vehicle registration specifically and choose the number of day grace period, which, you know, y'all are comfortable with. Um, you can also, uh, we saw in Virginia's 2020 law that there was, um, you know, something where there was a language around the basis of odor of marijuana um, as well as exhaust system. That's something you can choose uh, to include or forgo. So it's really about right-sizing the approach for your neighborhood. And I'm going to leave room for questions at the end. If anyone has anything pressing right now, we could get into it, but I think we're going to allow Hamilton to present. Um, I'm just going to leave up my contact information for one second in case anyone has pressing questions later. But with that, I'll leave it to Hamilton. <laughs> That's exactly it. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. It's really a pleasure um, to be here. Um, and thank you, Kat, for introducing me. Um, my name is Hamilton Brooks. I work with the Vera Institute of Justice. Um, I'll tell you more about our organization um, in the next slide. Um, but I'm a part of a team that's called the Sensible Traffic Ordinances for Public Safety Team. And I've worked with our team uh, for the past year and a half, coordinating specifically our local work working with local council members, police chiefs, as well as advocates themselves to um, advance policy and beyond that, think through um, policy and what works best for their own communities. So um, more about Vera and what it stops. Um, Vera is a 60 year old legacy nonprofit organization of researchers and advocates working to end the overcriminalization and mass incarceration of people of color, immigrants, and people experiencing poverty. Um, our North Star is building and supporting safe and thriving communities alongside a fair, accountable justice system. And as Kat laid out um, in her presentation, as we face across the country, um, intertwined crises of soaring roadway deaths and harmful racial disparities in traffic enforcement. We're really looking to think with lawmakers, local government leaders, and advocates through solutions to help address these racial inequalities, but also increase um, traffic safety on our roads. And in terms of the work that I've done, um, I supported four jurisdictions uh, to pass policy, whether that be working with a local DA to introduce their own policy, working with police chiefs themselves to introduce policies or to implement a policy within their department and their jurisdiction, as well as um, local lawmakers. And um, I think one of the things that I'll bring up specifically from the STOPS work is that we had a cohort of local jurisdictions that ran for about a year and a half. And uh, we had one jurisdiction who was a part of it, who joined it just for fact finding and for learning more information and looking into the data and the overall campaign effort around these policies, um, who stayed in that learning stage for about a year and a half before their police chief decided to um, introduce policy to limit um, some of these stops. And so my team on our redefining public safety team um, conducted a disparity analysis on uh, the police department's traffic stops data since 2011. So uh, talking uh, briefly, though, about a previous analysis um, that was conducted, and this just has some takeaways from it. Um, so this is comparing the data 2002, before, uh, 2002 to 2013 um, before the policy change within the Fayetteville Police Department was implemented, and then 2013 to 2016 when that policy um, was in place. Um, and so overall, this policy 
increase traffic safety while also reducing harm um, to black Fayetteville uh, drivers. And we saw safety stops uh, increase to 80% of all stops from 30% prior to the policy change. And really importantly, and um, traffic fatalities during this time decreased by 28% before the policy um, was brought in and injurious crashes reduced by 23%. And I think something that's really, um, really impressive um, about this Fayetteville policy is that sometimes what we've seen in other jurisdictions across the country is that when they bring in a policy like this, um, the total number of uh, black and brown drivers reduces. However, the racial disparity remains the same. But what we saw here was that the racial disparity actually uh, decreased between black and white drivers. So uh, getting a bit into the data that we're running, and I'm definitely going to be uh, talking everybody through these graphs because I recognize they're a bit far away um, and some of the numbers are small. Um, but with all of these, with all these graphs, they range from before 2011, um, 2009, all the way to like 2020, 2022, depending on uh, which one of the graphs that we're looking at. And so this first, this first one starts off with the total number of uh, traffic stops between 2009 and 2022. And so you can't see it completely clearly, but uh, in 2017, that was the end of the policy uh, that was in place uh, when Chief Medlock retired. And then 2013 was when it was implemented. And so as you can see, um, the number of traffic stops has really fluctuated over time, but there was an uptick of total traffic stops um, while that policy was in place. And that was um, also during the time that there were a significant increase in safety stops uh, being conducted and while the fatalities and injurious crashes um, were down as well. And as you can also see uh, here, after 2020, we're starting to see an uptick in um, total traffic stops, and we're going to be talking more about the composition of that in a moment. So um, this, this graph is um, talking about traffic stops by race um, from, 2020 not, or from 2009 excuse me, through 2022, and this is based off of like a population rate of stops per 10,000 um, drivers. And so what this graph shows is the green line is the total population group and red are black drivers and blue are white drivers. And so while the total number of stops has fluctuated across the years, you can see that the racial disparities in the number of people stopped is present um, throughout the data. Um, and so also uh, another visual that isn't seen here is that the percentage of safety-related stops, the stops that we want, um, increased and grew um, significantly between 2013 and 2020, um, reaching a height of around 80% in 2016. So um, more safety-related traffic stops being conducted, which is a good thing. However, um, now getting into the traffic stop disparity rates. Um, and so when we talk about the disparity rate, it's we're talking about the uh, likelihood that um, a, or the rate at which black drivers are stopped versus white drivers. And so what you can see again in, that, in those red dotted lines is that um, while the policy was in place, we saw a steep decrease in the disparity of black drivers versus white drivers being stopped. And then once the policy was you know, ended or rescinded, the disparities in stops continue to worsen between black um, and white drivers with a second rapid rise continuing after 2020. Um, and a note, a note about that, um, 2013 uh, was like around that time, that was when a letter was sent um, to the DOJ explaining um, the intensity and the pervasiveness of racial bias in traffic stops. And as you can see here, the rates that we are currently at are actually above the level that they're at when that DOJ letter was uh, sent 12 years ago. 
So <laughs> there's a lot here, but we're going we're gonna to work through it together. And uh, um, yeah, so we have uh, stop search rate um, by race. And so this first um, number on the graph you see to the right is the search rate disparity. So if you see a two or a four there, that means that black drivers are twice as likely to be searched or even 4.7 times more likely to be searched, as you can see in 2021. And the number that's next to it, the hit rate disparities, is sort of the difference between black and white drivers in terms of likelihood that they had a form of contraband on them. And so the crucial takeaway from this is that despite black, for example, we take 2021, despite black drivers being 4.7 times more likely to be searched, the difference in the contraband being found was just 1%, 1.22%. 1 um, and also about the stop search rates is that these are the rates around this are the people who are being chosen to be searched during traffic stops. So um, some conclusions, just rounding things out. Um, racial disparities, as I mentioned, are now at a higher rate than in 2012 when the DOJ was invited to review the high racial disparities in traffic enforcement. Um, and as we saw with the 2013 policy change, it decreased racial disparities overall. Um, the increase in total, and this is like my, my favorite conclusion, is that the increase in total stops while the policy was in place to limit non-safety related stops, um, while increasing, it increased the percentage of safety stops being conducted. There were more people being pulled over um, for speeding and other forms of hazardous driving, um, while also fatalities and traffic related injuries went down. It suggests that we can do both. Like we can be more effective in stopping dangerous driving and de decrease injuries and fatalities by focusing efforts on dangerous driving instead of these low level um, traffic violations where the disparities are extremely high and they don't impact public safety. Um, and from 2009 to 2022, at least, um, black people in Fayetteville are much more likely to be stopped and searched than their white counterparts despite possessing contraband at nearly identical and low rates. And um, yeah, this is um, part of our staff. And if you have any questions about us, any, anything wondering about data, any national um, perspectives, state level engagements going on, local engagements, um, feel free to reach out to any of us here. Uh, we're happy to talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Harris. Uh, see, uh, Councilman Mayor, I know you had had a question earlier. You were trying to follow the slide, but I think. Yeah. You can come back to me later. Okay. All right, Councilman Benavente. Uh, thank you, Mayor Colvin. Uh, just something that uh, Attorney Kerwin, you had talked about. If there is an incident of reckless driving, you know, excessive speeding, DWI, and that in the course of that stop, um, that 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 that's, uh, someone is determined to have bad tags, bad registration, they would still be cited. Right. Yeah, that's correct. So, what these pretextual stops policies really mean is that those non-safety related violations that I mentioned no longer can serve as the basis of the stop. So it's not the reason you know someone's getting pulled off the road. Um, but again, you know, as the council member mentioned, they'll still be cited if um, you know they're getting pulled over for another type of violation that is safety related. So speeding, whatever. Yeah. Um. Oh, yeah. And one thing that I'll add to that, actually, is that there's a number of different ways that different cities and jurisdictions have, like, handled this in terms of sending vouchers and notifications of these sort of minor vol minor violations to people, as well as supporting, like, fix-it tickets with, like, local, um, like, car repair and things like that as well for these sorts of um, violations for folks who um, maybe can't afford to um, fix it. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great point about the fix-it tickets. You know, I'm going to be asking my colleagues later to discuss ways that we can connect with our partners um, 
and the Cumberland County Courthouse, District Attorney's Office, uh, District Court uh, Judge's Office. Um, so I definitely want to hear maybe more about um, those fix-it type tickets. Um, the only other thing before I turn it to my colleagues is if you guys check out Granicus, um, there is a letter from the Denver police chief who was also regrettably unable to attend today. Um, I'm not sure if you guys got a chance to uh, take a look at that. Um, but uh, I'd encourage you to, t to read you know, his comments. Um, all this, I'm, I'm hoping, is going to be a very collaborative effort um, uh, with our uh, chief of police, uh, other advocates uh, that, that are here, um, and, and other ones that we want to bring in uh, to continue to kind of walk us through what works for Fadeville. Um, because I'm sure you guys all remember, you know, this Fable Observer article that, you know, everyone's got in front of them. You know, we do have an issue that needs to be addressed. How we go about addressing it, I think, is certainly something that we can work towards. Um, it doesn't have to be answered today. Um, uh, but I think we owe it to uh, our community to, to look at um, how people are being affected by their government uh, and to find a more equitable solution. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member here, you had something? Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. We appreciate you uh, coming to see us today. Thank you for the information. Doesn't look like it. All right, sir. If there's no other questions, I'll make a motion. Yeah. All right, Councilman Mahondra. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, in our uh, CCAM, we had the one deck, the one presentation, favorable traffic safety presentation, but. Uh, the one you presented, I don't think was in there. Do we? Is do we have that? Does anybody have that? Yeah. No. I'm. I'm definitely uh, happy to add it. Um, this uh, analysis our team did just over the past week, um, taking the aggregate information um, from the department. So happy to add that. Thank you, sir. All right. That's from Benavente. And Madam Clerk, you you have that deck now. Yeah. Great. So I guess that can get sent out to everybody. Um, Brooks, you said you've also worked with other jurisdictions in the past um, related to um, issues of state law preemption. Could you speak a little bit more to your success in that realm? Um, for sure. Happy to speak towards that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, preemption is um, something that always needs to be uh, looked at. But at the same time, there have been a number of jurisdictions um, in North Carolina who have already implemented this policy, whether it is when we've seen it not just through a police chief implementing it, we've also seen it um, through ordinance. Um, so there's there's like there's a pathway there's a pathway that has already been open towards that. Um, but also, um, my organization, uh, the Vera Institute of Justice, um, supports in that regard in terms of providing preemption analysis for jurisdictions. So um, if that's something that this body is interested in, feel free to reach out to us and happy to speak more towards that. Thank you so much again. And, and Mr. Mayor, at this time, I'll just ask that um, we ask for a consensus of council. We have a community safety uh, committee within city council made up of myself, Councilor Rahondros, and uh, Councilor Banks McLaughlin. Um, if we could work towards um, bringing in those additional partners uh, with our district attorney and, and district uh, court uh, chief judge. Um, and also making our regular meetings something that are open to the community to have more collaborative conversations. Um, I think uh, Dino and Brenda can remember how our homeless uh, committee meetings used to run. We bring in a lot of partners and have these roundtables. Um, you know, there's something in between a meeting and, and sort of the mayor's uh, coffee with the mayor, uh, where we're bringing in partners to, to to further this conversation and see what works for Fadeville. Um, so I'm hoping that the council will be uh, to authorize our uh, committee to to continue working towards this. To present to council in the future. So, just to make sure I'm, I'm clear. Yes. Um, you know, as the committee chair, city council doesn't usually give you the agenda that the, the committee chooses to discuss. Uh, yeah. I what, mean, if you guys are fine with me, you know, reaching out to. I mean, uh, you know, people. That's great. I mean, you. I think that's been the normal protocol, okay, great. and the committees do whatever they do and bring it if there's a consensus to bring it to council for some policy consideration. But if I'm understanding what your question is, you don't really have any policy consideration been asked today to well I mean I'm assuming there's going to be staff time you know involved in in, in you know having these regular uh, o uh, open meetings and uh, like you said that's typical for us to have you're right um, you know if you guys are saying that there, there's no concerns with us moving forward I've just explained what our next steps would be uh, I don't I don't know we've said anything we heard the presentation you you're the chair of that committee and you have staff support so I mean if that's okay something that you all want to do that you want the council to later consider I mean I think that would be something for discussion at that time. 
Uh, All right. So if, if you guys don't feel like you guys want to take a vote, that's fine. I understand um, the reasons why. Um, but, you know, it's always good to have, I think, the city council letting staff know that some of the uh, next steps that we're going to take are something that, you know, council is supportive of. Um, that, you know, I'm not asking Doug to help me set up meetings with people that, you know, the mayor didn't say yes to or that the city council didn't say yes to. But if that's not a concern, then, yeah, I'll absolutely pick this up and run with it. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what the purpose, what you and I talked about and yes, what, sir. what we've heard today is that you all will come and give us information. Uh, the city council will take that under consideration. And if there's some policy discussion to follow, I think that that's a conversation to be had. But I, I didn't uh, see any, any action being asked today. Yeah. The, the action would be for us to proceed with uh, looping in additional partners so that we can continue uh, to have conversations in this community about uh, driving equality laws and, well, and what got, works for us. You got an opportunity to make whatever motion. That, you that, that would be my motion. All right. So, as a motion by Council Member Benevente, can you repeat it? Yeah. That um, the uh, the, the uh, City Council's uh, Public Safety Committee, um, you know, continue to pursue partnership uh, and working towards driving equality laws in Fayetteville. All right. Is there a second? Council Member Banks McLaughlin, is that a second? All right. Motion and a second. Discussion on the motion? Well, I'll just say this. Um, you know, I was a part of the Governor's Racial Equity Task Force state, statewide, uh, people from different jurisdictions right after the, the 2020 George Floyd situation. So there were hours and hours and hours spent on what cities and, and recommendations that went to the legislature. And then the legislature had their own version of it, and they adopted about an eighth of what we spent about six months or a year uh, going through. But, you know, as you look at this, what, what Fayetteville ran in, I saw you kind of scrape the surface a bit. Uh, what they ran into back when the driving while black is what they kind of teamed it back then um, was what we were capable of doing. As I look at what you're saying, are these state laws or ordinances to have proper registration, relocation of tags, uh, proper vehicle with, you know, working condition. So these eight things that you have, are they ordinances or statutory issues? Um, so what do you mean? I mean, so in other words, is it a state law that says that your registration has to be renewed on time, or is it an ordinance? Yeah. I mean, it's got to be We're a talking law. about for... For Pennsylvania, or uh, just uh, I'm not concerned with Pennsylvania. I'm, I'm yeah, no, I'm, I'm just trying to understand oh, yeah. your question. Oh yeah, so sir. right here you said that there would be a grace period given for late registration. And is that a state law that says that your registration has to be renewed by a certain date, or is that a, a municipality ordinance that they can oh, adjust? Municipality. Yeah. 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 So it's not a state law that somebody that lives in Cumberland County has to renew their registration on the renewal date. Y'all sure about that? Yeah, the, I mean, there are there are um, laws being like the the state the, as a locality, you don't have the ability to create that sort of provision, which is the whole preemption issue. And I think it depends too on the state vehicle code. Like some of those offenses may live in the North Carolina vehicle code, but it kind of depends state by state. There's an officer over here that looks like. Well, I mean, I guess. Let, let me let me just try and clarify it this way. Beg your pardon, chief. Certainly, and so again, I think when we talk about making sure that we're checking all the boxes, talking with all the authorities on what is specific to us, there's room to have all those conversations, and that may make the tailored version for us something different. It may be just the fix-it type tickets. Right. That may be as far as that well, we can well, go. So what well, I'm let, saying let me, is that... Let me, let me finish my point, because oh, this is the discussion phase. So, so the reason I was asking that, you know, speaking with the Chief Ju District Court Judge yesterday, King, who, uh, and, and other judges, they already have a process that uh, if someone has a late registration and they renew it, they bring it in. Every Friday, they, they get it. So that's case. not what tax court is well, exactly. Well, well, that was what the judge said. Well, but but I, what, I, what I was saying uh, as part of my, my discussion on the motion is that I believe that is a, a more in-depth conversation uh, that can be had if the district attorney and the judges choose to play a role. It seems like to me that's a judicial-led initiative. However, that is the position that I have because a lot of these are statutes and not necessarily city ordinances is where we kind of ran into it the last time, so I won't be able to support the motion for that reason. All right, Councilman here. Thank you, uh, Mayor. And I just wanted to really understand on the motion, and the reason I'm, I bring it up 
I, I'm also chair of a number of committees, and a, we have a number of agenda items that a lot of times the committee brings together, unless it's something that comes from city council mm -hmm. that we address. And then there are a number of discussions that we have in our committee meetings that uh, may not always make it back for open discussion with the council. So what my question is, are you saying uh, to, to the councilman here, are you saying, and to you also, Mayor, uh, as the one that does the uh, appointing, that we need to have a council vote on items that we want to discuss in the meeting because we are able to bring what we discuss forward uh, anyway. And we're also now having our chairs of some of our committees, well, not some of our committees, but of our boards and committees to also, you know, we've, we're pushing that uh, through the board to come and give a discussion on what it is that we're having, you know, what they're doing and what the objectives are, what objectives they have met. So I'm just trying to understand, is it change? We have to change. No, I'd be glad to clarify. I think you gave a great example, Councilmember Hare. There are times when the council will ask the policy committee to look at something and to work on something. So we're not making the chairperson do anything. We're just asking for them to, to work on something, to do some legwork ahead of time. And then there's other times, like you said, where we control our agenda. Maybe we'll work on something and then you know bring it to us. So you're absolutely right. I could just do it. We could just do it. But what I'm hoping for is that we're signaling to the community, to our city staff, that this is a direction that we want to explore, that this is indeed something that has uh, you know, council consensus and support, not to go with a big policy change today because there are still some questions about how far we can go. We still have questions about who else uh, we need to get involved. Um, and there's, I think, the community that still doesn't fully understand what we're talking about or asking about. Th thank so you. I thank want us to be able to member. take so, time to so, get there. Uh, so thank you, council member. So that takes me back to what I was just initially saying. If we already can do that, I, I'm just asking the, the question, if we already can do that, why do, why do we need a motion to move forward to do what we can already do? It, it is not a need, it's a desire for us to sh demonstrate our commitment to addressing this issue that I believe we all agree is an issue that is worthy of being addressed. How we go about it, you know, that's why I want to push back against you know the mayor's comments earlier. It's not a matter of saying today the way we're going to do it. I mean, you gave an example of a way you can't support it. That's fine. We may never go that direction. We may end up going about it a very different way. Um, what I'm asking today is for simply this to be step one, and we don't necessarily know that the direction that we end up is going to be Philadelphia's model. We don't know if the direction that we're going to end up is doing anything at all. Because we may find out that, in fact, you know, preemption is such a problem that, that we just don't get there. Council but I'm still it, answering his question. Uh, yeah, I know, but it's, it's a long answer because you've got other council members. That, well, I'll, so I'll, pressure, I'll wrap up here. And just... for me. We'll circle back. I mean, you, yes, sir. All right. All right. So, Mayor Pro Tem and then Councilmember Thompson and then Benevente. Oh, I'm sorry. Banks McLaughlin. You had pressure button? Yeah. All right. Councilmember Thompson and Jensen and Banks McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm sitting here listening attentively, and what I keep hearing, a word that expressed a lot is community, community, community. I go to a lot of community watches. I go to a lot of community events. And I don't think there's, well, once again, I won't speak for everybody. I'll just speak for myself. But I know my community wants more stops, not less stops. I don't know a community here that's going to say, I want you to... Stop pulling that person over because he was speeding going 50 in a 45. Okay, you're absolutely right. He's got the floor count. So let me just emphasize a few things that I was listening to you say. You were saying how the traffic stops went down in 20 and 21. There wasn't nobody driving in 2021. COVID was going on in 20 and 21. You talk about disparity, and you talked about racial disparity, but you didn't put up any crime stats. I don't... Once again, let me just speak for myself. I have a hard time for people to say that we have a racial disparity when, and I'm just taking these numbers off the top of my head. I know we had the third quarter police report, but I can't remember all the numbers, Chief. But I'm just going to be, give you a straight number. If 80% of the crime is being done by 80% of the people, and 80% of the people are black, why are we only stopping 10% of the black people? Shouldn't we be stopping 80% of them? 
those are the way the numbers should work out to me. You just gave a stat saying that we had 600 fatalities in, I remember what year, and 28% of them was black. But only the population was 18%. I thought those was good numbers. So why would we change that? When you talk about disparity, let's look at the crime rate when you give your presentation, and not just stops. Because there's a reason why certain individuals are getting stopped, because those are the individuals that are committing the crimes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Talk to him about the contribution. All right, Council Member Benevente, you, you've got a couple ahead of you. We're coming. So Mayor Pro Tem Jensen. But he, he didn't. Yeah, he, I think he was making a statement. All right, Council Member Benevente, you can ask in just a minute. Mayor Pro Tem and then Banks will thank, come. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm going to direct my questions to you. So hopefully you can answer them for me. And if you can't, that's okay. So my first question is, um, on your website, I look and I see that you're in eight states that you, all over the nation, that there's eight states that, um, rep that you have. So how many cities are represented in North Carolina by you that have representation? Do you mean local progress or Vera Institute? Local progress. Yeah. So we, uh, I don't know the exact amount of cities. I do know uh, Council Member Benavante is on our uh, North Carolina organizing committee. Um, and we have, I believe, I can look up the complete membership for you and send it your way. Okay. So on your website, what I saw it was, um, I guess, due to Council Member Benavente, Fateville is on there, and yeah. Durham is on there as well. Yeah, we have Asheville seen. and some other folks. So yeah. not on the website. So what I saw was those two. So I guess my question is, as you're talking about um, these policies and ordinances, has Asheville or Durham, are, are they moving to do this? Yeah, Durham is working on a civilian oversight model, um, so it's a little different than the pretextual stops model that we kind of went over today. The civilian traffic model is where uh, they they would create, the city would create a um, wholly new department outside of the police department who would manage traffic uh, related issues. And there's actually North Carolina, the legislature passed enabling legislation, I believe last year, that allows North Carolina cities and towns um, to uh, civilian yeah crash. To, yeah the civilian yeah, crash um, law so that you know avoids any preemption related concerns. So, so as I heard, that's what, hold, hold that, on a second. I don't think that's used like. Yeah, it's for the crashes. Yeah. 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 Right, that's correct. But I'm just saying that Durham is also working on a civilian oversight model. So we already have that, Mr. Mayor, is what you're yeah, I don't telling me? It's an oversight. It's, it's not. A civilian no, they're crack. two separate things. Yeah, oh, there's okay. enabling legislation that allows for um, a wholly different department so, to, to review crashes, and then there's the Durham. So before I. Oversight. I, I'm going to have to you know, say that I can't support this motion, and I will say that I know that it is. Something that is state legislature, you know, that is a state law and things like that. But what I would say is, you know, I see that you have Fateville, Durham, and you have Asheville now that I, I didn't realize that you had that. And a lot of the procedures, you know, that we are doing right now, our crime rate is the lowest it's been in seven years. Our crime rate is down 7%. And... You know, I, I consider myself a friend of the mayor and the mayor pro tem in Durham, and they're struggling. Their crime rate is going up, you know, every year. So if everybody asks why I cannot support this, um, you know, these are one, one of the many reasons that I can't. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. Thank you, Councilman Banks McLaughlin. Then uh, Green, first round, Benevente after. Um, thank you, Mayor, and thank you guys for the uh, presentation. Um, I serve um, on this committee um, along with my colleague. Um, just from hearing the feedback, um, I think it, if possible, you might want to draw back your um, your motion um, as we sit on the committee with you. All the information, um, possibly connecting with other stakeholders in the community, that's something that we can do 
amongst ourselves, and if there's any policy changes need to be done, that can be something that we bring towards um, with council if you're interested in pulling back your motion. Thank you. All right. Council Member Green and then Benefit Day. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in your presentation that we have that was on the screen, on the page Driving Equality Policy in Fayetteville, the very first bullet point states that in 2013, the Fayetteville became one of the first police departments to reprioritize traffic stops to focus on safety while de-emphasizing regulatory traffic stops with an informal departmental driving equality policy. And then it states as a bullet point that the policy was rescinded after Chief Medlock retired. Can you tell me what policy you're referring to? Because I, I don't recall that at all, and I would really like a point of reference back to that because I have lived here my entire life and I don't recall anything similar. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to answer that. Um, so yeah, so Chief Medlock, um, so we, we, we've we actually um, done a article where we talked with Chief Medlock and we um, found that he was actually the first person to implement a policy like this like in the country. And so um, as I was explaining a little bit earlier, there's different ways that these that this policy can manifest in different ways. And then one of them is simply a police chief um, issuing a directive to the department that they are going to uh, deprioritize or perhaps reclassify um, certain types of violations, whether that's making one like primary or making one, sorry, making a set of um, violation secondary so if there's like a primary sort of stop like somebody is like speeding for example and then they catch that person and then they also see that they're like one of their taillights is out yeah, so. then they can include like the taillight on that um, speeding sort of offense um, and so some uh, police chiefs actually have these policies like and they put them out there um, as like an official sort of document and you have other police chiefs who have it as more so an informal practice um, within the department, but um, I can definitely assure you that um, Chief Medlock did have this policy in place. We've had him um, come and speak to a group of council members as well as police chiefs that we had a part of our cohort um, to this policy. So you're saying his, his policy was informal? Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a policy directive um, towards his department to um, deprioritize certain violations. But as an officer, as a as an officer that's in a patrol car every day, you would have to know about that policy, whether it was formal or informal, correct? Yes, for sure. So can I ask Chief Braden if you're aware of any type policy from Chief Medlock, since I'm pretty sure you were around in those days? Like I said, myself and the rest of the command staff in the room were all police officers under Harold Medlock. Uh, there was never a policy, there was never a standing order or anything of that nature that was put out to police officers on what they could or couldn't stop for. I can say this, uh, the high, in the past decade, the highest number of traffic stops on record occurred under Chief Medlock with nearly 71,000 for the year. So again, there's, I don't know which policy they're referencing to, uh, we've actually done a search on our policies. We've done a search on our standing orders, internal memos, and things of that nature, and there's nothing to indicate that there was any posture taken by Chief Medlock on traffic stops. What, was there any type of policy under Chief Hawkins? I know that we're not really, but I, I just want to understand if this is something that's... So I think any chief, to include myself, would be very careful on delivering any edict standing orders or policies that were in violation of the law or had an, some indication of why we would or wouldn't stop for a violation of North, established North Carolina law. I mean, because I think the general public's consensus was that under Chief Hawkins, there was very little stopping going on. Um, so that's why I asked that point in question because I... I want to give the public a sense of, you know, so from, what from, was happening. From 2015, which was a high year, nearly 71,000, uh, the following year, uh, no, 16, uh, when 
Chief Anthony Kelly was here, dropped to about 49,000 stops for the total year. And it probably continued to cut by half until 20, uh, 2022. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're getting the policy for you and we'll share it so you can see okay. the written policy that was in fact in place. Well, any, any policy would have had to come through the, the governing body at that time, wouldn't it? I mean, unless it was... It was an informal policy, okay. so it was, you know, right. officer directive. Okay. All right. So have um, uh, Council Member Benevente, and then uh, she had asked to answer a question for Council Member Thompson. So. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I, I may just let uh, Ms. Kerwin uh, speak to it because um, the comment that crime data was not included is, is totally false. The contraband is... Councilman Councilman, Thompson. You're addressing the council. The, the, the contraband data shows that whether you're black, white, Asian, Latino, you are, no one group is more likely to be doing the crime. So your analogy that if 80% of the crime is being committed by black people, then we should be erasing 80% of black people is completely inaccurate. It's outrageous, in fact. When you look at the data, it is pretty much equal across the entire board. So it makes no sense for one group to be stopped and searched at this rate. So by your own logic, that situation, that, that, that straw man example that you gave is not the situation in favor. It's actually the opposite. So you should really be supportive of this because right now justice is not being done equally. The, another, the other comments that were made, again, Mayor Colvin, Mayor Pro Tem Jensen, you guys are saying that you don't want to support looking into this because it's going to go in a direction that you don't want it to go. That's not what I said. And you, well, I, that's what I heard. Well, I heard you say well, that the crime is going don't down. Don't quote me. Just say that's your interpretation. So what I heard, what I heard was that you are not supportive of exploring into this because you assume it's going to go in a direction that you don't agree with. What I'm saying is that it's, it's, we're not going to go the way of Durham if that is not what works for us. And the, the problem, Council Member Portem Jensen, is not an issue of the crime going down. It's the disparity it's the disparity in who is being policed and who is not. And this is an issue that we have, regardless of if it's 10% of people getting stopped or 80% of people getting stopped. The disparity is the issue, not the, not the total number. So I, I don't think you guys are giving, and this is the reason why I want to have this walk through with the community as well, because the biggest misconception is that people want more traffic stops. They don't want more traffic stops. They want things to be safe on the road. Now, can we make things safe on the road? Can we make things safe, well, but again, People who do not confront people who do not confront their constituents on their misunderstandings will claim that. But the second that I ask people, "Do you want a safer community?" they say yes. How do we do that? They only can think of police. They can't think of a con another way to address these issues. When in fact, I've asked Chief Braden this before: How many speeding tickets do you have to give to someone before they stop speeding? Turns out that that's not actually the solution to get people to stop speeding. There's actually a plethora of ways that people have in other cities made infrastructure changes that have made changes to the way that a lot of things in their city operate that have actually stopped and prohibited and reduced those types of traffic issues. So when your community members say, we want more cops, we want more this, we want more that, what they really want is just a problem to get solved, regardless of who gets it done. So let's not make bad arguments that no one is actually making. Nobody is demanding the cops be the only ones to solve these issues, especially if there's proven methods to address this a different way. Ms. Kerwin, if you wanted to uh, further explain why um, crime stats were included and why they do not support targeting one community, I'd ask you to please explain that without as much passion. Yeah, and I would also just like to say um, in terms, in regard of uh, Chief Medlock and the Fayetteville policy, I'm just going to list out some of the sources that have reported on it saying that he was the person who put in this policy in 2013. We have the Columbus Dispatch reporting it. We have the Fayetteville Observer. We have the UNC School of Government. Um, and these are all just reports that I've seen on the first page of Google results um, around the policy. So, but Kat, please. You're talking about the driving while black. Uh, when the city council did it, Chief Medlock didn't do that, if that's what you reference. No. I, but, but okay. No. Got, point sorry, take, I, point I, I just, uh, if you don't mind. Um, it says, um, from the Fayetteville Observer, um, Medlock went further, quote, um, requiring officers to conduct stops only for serious driving offenses, not regulatory and equipment stops for broken taillights and expired tags. Um, and then the quote that he says afterwards is, it's, quote, it's funny, a lot of folks think we stopped doing traffic enforcement. 
All right. Thank so you. we're happy to send you those news reports, oh, yeah. um, but it's a policy. It was in place. Um, you know, uh, we'll make sure we link those articles so y'all can read them with your own eyes. Those are direct quotes from Chief Medlock. Um, so, and thank you for asking that question. I don't want there to be any confusion there. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So, um, for. Yeah, yeah, I got you down. I got you down. Let, let me let me go back to something. I have Councilman Mah so the orders, Colvin Hondros, Harry Thompson, and then uh, hopefully we can see if you want to uh, call the question on this motion or or do something different. Um, let me be clear, okay? We talked about this when we got our crime report. The underlying causation of this, right? Because we all know this is not just a federal issue that Black and Brown stops uh, are disproportionate to other races, but so is poverty. And poverty is the underlying cause that if somebody has to pay a light bill or renew tags, that causes that. Now, the judges, the district attorney, and others in the judicial system who this is more in their space have a process that they're not punitively punishing people because they couldn't afford to renew their tags. They said, when you get it renewed, bring us the receipt and we will eliminate or drop this uh, this charge is what it was explained to me. So, well, well understood, but I'm, I'm just giving you the conversation that I had on yesterday with Judge King. And so every Friday there's a process, whatever that is, okay, yep. whatever the details of it are. Yeah. This is not a situation where, uh, you know, as my colleague tries to make it, the city council doesn't care about uh, an issue. It is an issue, but the underlying causation to this issue is the fact that poverty is two times as much in black and brown communities as it is in the other community here, and which is going to have impacts of things like this. Now, we have went through this process and, and have asked the police department doing these reports to make sure that they're looking at everything holistically to make sure that they're not unfairly targeting one particular race or another because they are uh, of a certain race before they make the stop. Yeah. But I don't think it is within our purview or capability to tell sworn officers who we are given the authority and they're given authorities on a statutory level, on a state level, that they can't enforce statutes. Now, you said there were pathways to it, and I'm sure that's something that this committee could get to, well, right? Yeah. But, and so I just want to clear the air on that, that the, 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 the hesitation is not to fix this problem. It just didn't have to be his fix. Do you or, mind if I answer that? Sure. Okay. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I mean, I think, you know, like, absolutely, you know, fines and fees reform with the courts is definitely a part of this work. Um, again, you know, we mentioned that there are jurisdictions across the country, towns and cities that are doing this work. Um, and so it's not something that, you know, like it can be a state level issue, but it's also we're seeing cities and towns just like Fayetteville lead the way on this. And it's important um, for this to come from cities and towns and not just be left to the courts. Because if cities and towns are, you know, removing the instances in which, you know, specifically black and brown community members are stopped um, by police, you eliminate the chances for these traffic stops that could become violent. We saw in Memphis, Tennessee, um, after Tyree Nichols was murdered by police, um, the Memphis City Council passed a law um, that deprioritized low-level traffic stops. Um, and I think that, you know, that's kind of where this is going, where we're going with this, is it's important for cities and towns to make the moves and give direction to police here because we're eliminating the ways in which these stops could become violent. Instead, as Hamilton mentioned in his presentation so eloquently, you know, we're deprioritizing the stops. We're, we're still creating real safety by making uh, sure people for those safety and, and related I, and offenses. I appreciate that. Yeah. I, I went to Memphis earlier this year. Uh, Mayor Young called 20 of us to his city, okay. and his police officers are complaining their crime has skyrocketed. Not saying the two are related, I'm just telling you the state of affairs. They're confused as to what they can and can't do, and mm -hmm. they feel unsupported, and they have a huge uh, gap in police officer retention, and their crime rates are out, out, out of whack. I mean, and, and I'm not saying the two are related, but what I'm saying is you gave an example of Tyree Nichols, which was rooted in some other personal vendetta, uh, according to what I, what's been printed, that that some of the officers actually knew him or his girlfriend or something. But you know, 
point taken, but what I'm saying is the unintended consequences of some of that have called Memphis to be in a, in a mess. And I know that firsthand from speaking to Paul about it. Yeah, so I, I think with Memphis specifically, like they, there was a whole uh, issue from uh, Memphis with also their uh, state legislature in regard to uh, preemption. And that's not just an issue they've been going through on driving equality. It's been on a lot of things. I'm sure the mayor spoke with you about that. So I think I think Memphis is a little bit of a different example in that yeah, I know regard. Brought it up uh, brought it up. Oh no, no, uh, I'm not. No, definitely not. Um, but but yeah, Ed, that's just to say that the Memphis policy was, uh, in terms of its implementation, there's a lot of evidence that that didn't fully get really off the ground. Like I know some advocates on the ground who who mentioned that like as well. So yeah. it's a bit of a nuance. The case, that you. one. All right. So you do have other other council members that, that yeah. been waiting patiently. Councilman Mahadros here, Thompson, and then we need to move this, guys. We got four more items. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think uh, Council Member Green pretty much asked asked my questions, and it's I mean, it appears we literally have a he said she said situation where because um, my question was exactly what was the policy that FPD had under Chief Medlock? Uh, when was it rescinded? Why was it rescinded? And it looks like we're getting mixed uh, mixed reports on that. So uh, unless we can get some clarity on it. Um, I think you just got to, like, r the news publications, like, have all of the information that you need. If well, you do so your own research, we'll send so, you as well. Yeah. So you're going to tell me that the media is never wrong? No, no, I'm not saying that at all. Okay, sir. let's not go what, there. What, what, so, uh, so, Oh, yeah, of course. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, we're saying this based off of accounts from Chief Medlock himself and as well as Assistant Chief uh, Anthony Kelly um, in interviews that they've done like online and then also what they've spoken to us. So if, 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 if this were not the case and that policy was not there, that, you know, that would mean that all of these statements to these publications were somehow in incorrect. Right. To be clear, yeah. I can either confirm nor deny that there was a policy in place or what that policy was or when it was rescinded and why it was rescinded. That's kind of what I'm trying to get to the bottom of. I think you cited, if I'm not mistaken, three sources, three sources, the Columbus Dispatch, Fable Observer, and was the other one the UNC School of Government? Yes. Okay, I'd love to see the UNC School of Government. Uh, sure. I well, can, I can well, bring my we laptop. Well, well the, yeah. the, the article that you referenced, Council, and you can see it, was about consent searches when the city council at that time made them require them to sign a consent search to search the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Chief, you know, and then there was a, a, a big um, debate about whether that was legal or not. And, and, uh, uh, and what happened out of that, once Chief Mellock came, he said in his quote that you read was he was less concerned with some of the lesser serious offenses. It, it didn't necessarily say it was a city policy. He said they stopped using the consent forms. Uh, reading the rest of the article, so I don't know. Yeah, if no, read. no, definitely not. Definitely not a, a city policy. Yeah. Uh, okay. Corrected. All right. So uh, I'll just yeah, close with this. There was a policy change. There was a that required us to have written consent to search a car. Correct. There was nothing in the policy that referenced what we could or couldn't stop for. Right. Right. Folks had to sign. So. All right, all right, Councilman Mahadros. Mr. Mayor, if I may. So the last, since, since this uh, issue was brought up, I've had a lot of residents reach out to me and they asked a question, because we say these, you know, uninsured motorists, expired tags are a lesser offense or they're not making the roadways unsafe. And they say, well, I have my vehicle not only registered, but inspected. It's a safety inspection. So... Why should I be subjected to fellow drivers that are not insured, that are not, if they don't have the vehicle inspected, they may not be uh, uh, road worthy and those things. So I would love to hear you, you guys' answer on that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. And it's a good question. Um, I think our answer to that would be, you know, these folks, you know, say someone doesn't have an updated registration or does have an expired registration or has one tail light out. Um, again, as we mentioned before, uh, these policies, it does not say that 
you know, they could no longer be ticketed. It doesn't say that they, like, you know, like you couldn't, you know, receive some sort of violation. All it says is it no longer serves as the basis for the stop. So it can't be that, you know, that first connection between a police officer and a community member. It can still lead to a ticket. Right. And also, you know, you can, as I said, I talked a little about right sizing the approach, making it work for Fayetteville. You know, maybe it means giving someone a grace period of like five days after registration happens. Maybe someone just had a baby. Maybe someone had a bad day. Yeah. So maybe it's like allowing a grace period or finding another way to kind of right size the approach. But yeah, it doesn't mean that that, you know, individual is never going to get their registration. It doesn't mean that, yeah. Uh, turn my mic on. So, but, uh, the other side of that, is, you know, you mentioned, or you quote how many um, firearms were taken off by these stops. And again, these residents, they say, well, isn't that a good thing? So even though the, a stop may be uh, precipitated from expired tags, if there's an illegal firearm in the car or any other contraband that gets taken, even if it was from this stop that we say is not really protecting public safety, but in that in those instances, it absolutely had the potential to save, uh, you know, a life or, or whatever if that that illegal firearm was used in a in a illegal act. Yeah, um, it, it's 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 actually. Uh, I'm just telling you what the residents are asking. For for sure, um, and Kat, uh, please add to this answer as well. Um, but it's interesting uh, with some jurisdictions that have passed this policy. They've actually found that they find more contraband and more firearms um, when their searches are directed on safety-related stops instead of non-safety-related ones. All right. So I do have a couple of council members that have not had a round. Uh, Councilman Davidson McNair, and then uh, we should finish it with Hare and Thompson. All right. Council Councilman Davis? Yes, thank you, Ms. Mayor. So my, I guess my question is for my colleague. What is the conversation looking like when you talk to some of the connecting partners? Because I talked to uh, District Attorney uh, Billy West this morning, and he, they do have something where you can come into compliance, and then they'll, dis they'll dismiss the tags or whatever the fee is. The fraction. The um, so what does the conversation look like? Or is the conversation for those partners to help create a policy or help send something up to change the statute? That's it. Thank you for that question. Councilmember Davis, um, y'all may know I practice criminal defense here in the city of Fayetteville, North Carolina, in Cumberland County Courthouse. I regularly go to TAC court, and I'm telling you all right now, there is what it says it does, and there is what actually happens, right? So maybe the difference is that out of all of this, unlike what the mayor said earlier about it having to be my way or the highway, that's not true at all, sir. I want us, as a consensus of council, as a consensus of this community, to say that we are not satisfied with these numbers and that we're going to find an answer. And that answer doesn't have to be my preferred answer. It does not have to be what Philadelphia did. The answer could simply be, we're going to better advertise tax court. When I talked with our district attorney, he said, you know what, it's been a while since we updated um, the police department to make sure that people remember to ensure that infractions go on tax court day. Because sometimes people get uh, their, their ticket and it's not on tax court day, right? There's people who plead guilty and pay, their, and pay things before they realize that they could have addressed it a different way. This could all end up being something that Lauren Beimer helps us out with marketing some of these things that are happening with the courthouse already. That could be the ultimate solution to all of this because we never get any further than that. If that's as far as this city council wants to go towards addressing that, I will consider that progress. What I'm not satisfied with is us continuing to have this issue and looking the other way, pointing fingers at who else needs to work on it when we could do our part as well. Even if our part is very nominal, even if our part is very small. What I can't abide by is everyone making false statements about uh, crime in the city. Council Member, you answer his question. I've got to get McNair, and then I, I can put you down for the final of it. But you can't go and as if it's your turn. You were just supposed to answer his question. So the answer to your question, sir, is that that is a aspect of this that I think it can be approved upon. I think we have a role in addressing all of this, and in collaboration, I think we can improve on even that uh, aspect while uh, creating some additional ones as well with the consensus of council and the community. All right. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, council Member McNair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. First of all, I want to thank all of you for this uh, educational information. Uh, however, um, we're getting nowhere fast here. 
And I want to um, reflect back on uh, Council Member uh, Banks McLaughlin um, statement that she made earlier. I think this is the item that needs to go back to the committee um, because uh, I think it requires uh, further discussion and ironing out um, some hurdles here uh, because we're just going back and forth here. I, I would like to see us move forward and take this back to the committee. All right, thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, who do we, is it? Oh, I'm sorry, we have hair. Hair, Councilman Hare. And, and thanks, Mayor. Um, as I stated earlier, uh, looking at the motion, I know we just discussed a, a lot tonight, but going back to the motion, since we as a committee and chairs of those committees have the right to bring things into that committee, discuss it, and then when they come, they come on uh, the agenda, we have an opportunity to share that information with council. And if council decides to move forward, accept the report or whatever the case may be. So the reason I wasn't, uh, I'm not in support of it is because we already have that, I feel, in place for us to do now on new and additional items that come to the various committees. All right, and just as Councilwoman Banks had said about 30 minutes ago, right? <laughs> All right, so, Council, we've had adequate discussion. So, Council Member Benevento, are you going to follow the, the recommendation of your Councilwoman to take this on a committee level, or are you going to do sure, something different? Sure. So, I'm going to accept um, what I feel like is a consensus of Council for the committee to go through the committee process, the established committee process, um, to continue to work on this issue, um, in which case there is no need for a vote. So you withdraw the motion? So uh, I will withdraw the motion under the understanding that it seems like we do have some interest in working towards this. We don't know what the answer is yet, but there is a consensus at least for us to look into what we're going to do. Thank you. So the motion is withdrawn. Thank you, guys. We Thank appreciate you it. so much. Appreciate it. Good information. All right, Council, moving to 6.02, uh, report by PB Mayors and Audit and Financial year in. Mr. Hewitt, who is that? Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor, members of Council. Great pleasure that we have um, Robbie Bittner back with us again um, from PB Mayors, who will walk us through the report. Um, as he uh, gets uh, geared up, I would like to take this opportunity to um, thank um, Assistant City Manager Jeff Yates and all of our finance um, team who, members who may be here. Um, I don't see them at the moment. Uh, there we go in the back, um, Amanda and others. But um, um, you can stay for 10 minutes, and then you got to go back upstairs. So, But um, <laughs> uh, they have literally um, not had much sleep over the last couple of weeks trying to um, get this prepared and um, ready for Mr. Bitten to provide it to you tonight. So thank you. Today. <laughs> All right, sir. It's on you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt. Appreciate it. On behalf of myself uh, and uh, PB Mayors, I would like to say thank you to the city for allowing us to continue to serve. Um, we do have, I'm going to be pretty quick with this presentation, unless everybody would like to really go through audits. Um, you know, auditing is the most exhilarating subject. We've been that looking we have. forward to that all <laughs> week. But we'll skip it this time. So, but. <laughs> Well, in any case, uh, I'm happy to be here in November presenting these financial statements versus uh, later in the year. This is the earliest the financial statements have been presented uh, to the city council in about 15 or 16 years. So um, uh, kudos to your staff. They worked very hard. As uh, Mr. Hewitt said, they were up late at night. They would answer my, my questions on Saturday afternoons, Sunday mornings. So it's very, uh, very commendable. So thank you for that. Um, as auditors, we're charged with rendering an opinion on your financial statements as to whether or not they're fairly presented in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles uh, or GAAP. With that, we can issue four types of opinions. Uh, the cleanest, or the, excuse me, the cleanest, <laughs> the highest level of assurance that we can provide is that clean or unmodified opinion. So I'm not going to bore you with the other type because the city did receive an unmodified opinion uh, from PB Mayors this year. Uh, in addition to our opinion on the financial statements, we also issue a report on 
uh, internal control and compliance in accordance with government auditing standards. Here, uh, we are required to report any material noncompliance with laws, regulations, uh, grants, or statutes, as well as uh, identify any uh, deficiencies in con internal control that we consider to be significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. Uh, we did have two items that – am I talking in this thing right? <laughs> did have two items that did meet the level of material weakness to be reported this year, uh, one related to accounts payable cutoff and the other one was related to recording of a grant loan program. So uh, those will be – those are issued in that as, and identified as 2024-001 and –002. Uh, in addition to the report on internal control and compliance, we also issue our opinion on your compliance with the uniform guidance for your federal grants, the State Single Audit Implementation Act for your state grants, and also the passenger facility charge program at the airport related to the, the uh, PFC charges uh, that come in each year. So we issued an unmodified opinion on all three of those and happy to say as well that we did not have any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in internal control over that compliance uh, identified during the course of the audit this year. Um, I believe uh, you have received, uh, council has received the report to city council here. This is our auditor's communication to those charged with governance. This is required communications by auditing standards, um, and they must be in writing. I'm not going to go through a whole lot of this, but I will uh, just hit a few uh, high points on here. Uh, first one being that uh, in accordance with GASB, the implementation of GASB Statement Number 100, uh, there is an emphasis a matter paragraph in the opinion stating that the change within the uh, financial statements well, within the financial reporting entity for the difference between a major fund and a non-major fund is now considered a restatement. So there is a restatement for that related to the aggregate non-major uh, aggregate non-major governmental funds as well as the environmental protection fund. So as this being presented as major this year, primary reason for that is. Uh, the a lower number of deferrals related to the ARPA money that was received and the still re high remaining <laughs> deferrals related to FEMA that are out there. So uh, addition to, in, in addition to that, uh, we did not have any uh, disagreements with management. As, a, as I mentioned earlier, they were very agreeable and very easy to work with um, in providing us the information we needed. Uh, we also, in this report, you'll see uh, the estimates that uh, management makes to come up with uh, some of the numbers that you see within the financial statements. We agreed with all of their uh, estimation techniques and that their um, estimations are in accordance with GAAP. Uh, you'll also have recorded audit adjustments, which we did have uh, three recorded adjustments related to the material weaknesses that, we, that I spoke about earlier. And <clears throat> you'll, have, you'll see that there are a few uncorrected misstatements, which we looked at both quantitatively and qualitatively and believe they are not material to the financial statements. Um, uh, you're, you do have one additional report that is in this report to City Council this year that is new. Uh, you had a HUD program that required a year-end, uh, or excuse me, not year-end, but a program-end closeout audit. And we included that as part of our uniform guidance uh, testing this year. So there is a separate report within the document that you see um, in the report to City Council that will not be in your uh, annual act for, for 2024 because it is already included as part of the uniform guidance uh, opinion. The last item that I'll cover uh, is the last few pages of this is the Local Government Commission's performance indicators. As you may be aware, when we complete the data input form that is required to be submitted to the LGC with your financial statements, uh, there are a lot of numbers and a lot of questions, and there's a section in a tab called performance indicators. If something pops red, then it requires a response from the City Council to the LGC for those items. Uh, the city did have three items that met that this year, uh, one being uh, just the significant – or excuse me, the material weaknesses that I just identified, another being the budgeted ad valorem revenues were more than 3 uh, percent 
less, or excuse me, more than 3% more than the actual collections of ad valorem revenues. And then the last one is related to the LGC's 25% uh, of available fund balance uh, as it relates to expenditures. Uh, the city came in right at about 22%. And the main reason for that was for a, uh, a large chunk of encumbrances that were made right at the end of the year for, for, for the fiscal year. Overall, um, I was very pleased with the audit situation this year. Uh, the extra resources really helped out. And um, we, again, certainly appreciate. And I know that the finance will be appreciative of not being under audit for the course of the entire year. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, I do have a couple. Councilman Mahondrosen in here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I want to thank our partners at PB Mayors, but more importantly, uh, Mr. Hewitt and staff. Um, a few months back, council shared our displeasure with the audit being late for the second year in a row. Myself, I was one of the <clears throat> most um, vocal, I guess, of, of my displeasure. So um, I think it's only fair that we commend them for a job well done. I think uh, the gentleman said uh, it was the earliest we've done this report in um, 15 years. 15, 16 years. So congratulations to the team. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Council Member Heron and Thompson. Yes, sir, that, that was it, Mayor. I was, uh, was just gonna do the same thing as uh, my colleague. Uh, uh, I'm a member, I'm the chair of the board, Council Member Hondros and um, Thompson are council members that serve on the board. And just thumbs up because we've come a long ways uh, with our audit and being late with our state audit. Uh, we've come a come long ways. Uh, Ms. Rose, I thought I saw her earlier. Thank her and our department. They're doing a great, great job uh, moving forward and just wanted to give them a thumbs up. Thanks, guys. Thank you, sir. All Thank right. you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Bittner. Thank you, Ms. Rose. I think it's time that we receive this report, Mr. Mayor. I just did have one question about those red line items that you yes, had. Sir. Uh, one was... Uh, you said the fund balance percentage was under 25% of the, the, ava the available fund balance as the LGC calculates it. Um, it's total cash plus uh, restricted cash, less PAL bill funds. And so it, there's about, there's about eight use. different okay. numbers that go into the numerator and eight or nine different numbers that go into the denominator that they. But it was some end of, the, end of the fiscal year, larger expenditures. Yes. It's, pro okay. It's, it's related to the biggest item that kind of kicked that percentage out was a four, was $14 million in encumbrances in the general fund. Gotcha. Okay. So. All right. Councilman Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let me just add a little bit more to the question that you just asked about the Avalorum <laughs> tax. I think a lot of that was uh, overestimated because we lost almost $4 million. And that $4 million came from vehicle registration and property tax. So if we don't stop pay people from paying their vehicle registration and property tax, we'll be losing more money. But on that note, Mr. Mayor, I like that we have received the report. All right. Motion by Councilman Thompson, seconded by Hare. Received the report. Discussion? All right. Council, I look to you for action. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right, motion carries. Moving to 6.03, ARPA portfolio update. Yes, sir, uh, Mayor and Council, um, uh, Brooke Redding um, is here. And um, in advance, uh, many of you know, Brooke has um, taken on the charge of heading up our um, ARPA uh, program management. He and his team have done an amazing job, and we're very excited to have him give you an mm -hmm. update at this time. And I think uh, if, uh, Brooke, if you could cut down your two-hour presentation to maybe 45 two, three minutes. minutes. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members, and everyone here today. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to present an update on the ARP portfolio and our upcoming obligation plan or ongoing obligation plan. I am Brooke Redding, the Special Projects Manager from the City Manager's Office. And today I'm going to walk you through what we've achieved in, uh, with the ARPA funds uh, so far and how we are ensuring compliance with federal requirements and our strategies to make the most of these resources for the city. 
Uh, so today, just a brief overview uh, of what we're going to cover. I'll start by providing some background on the ARPA program, a high-level overview of our current portfolio, and we'll then dive into the federal obligation requirements, our strategy for meeting these deadlines, and a key shift of uh, we're removing certain projects to the capital improvement plan to better manage timelines. And then finally, I'll wrap up with uh, our next steps and closing remarks before opening, thing, opening up for any questions you might have. So the City of Fayetteville received just over $40 million of federal funding uh, under the American Rescue Plan Act, which was designed to help us, uh, help us and communities like us address social and economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, our, our ARPA funding has been strategically allocated across 40 plus projects, all focused on supporting economic vitality, housing stability, critical infrastructure, and community resilience. Uh, the, this funding allows us to address Council's strategic goals that were laid out in 2022 uh, and tackle some of the most presenting needs in our community with a focus on creating those lasting impacts. Our first focus area is uh, the first strategy that Council laid out, which is business and economic vitality, where we've directed funding to programs that support small business development, workforce training, and general economic stability. We've invested in projects like small business grants and workforce development initiatives with nonprofits that help our local businesses thrive and <clears throat> keep residents employed. Uh, through this focus area, we're addressing that goal of building a more prosperous and resilient economy and providing businesses with resources that they need to grow and adapt. Programs like the Small Business uh, Development Grant and the Commercial Corridor Improvement Grant have provided uh, direct financial support to entrepreneurs and business owners helping them stabilize their operation and maintain jobs, mostly in our 14 qualified census tracts in the city. Overall, uh, as you can see, there's about $13.5 million of this $40 million award went directly to support uh, businesses, growth, and workforce development. The housing and community uh, livability is our next priority area that Council laid out where we aim to enhance the residents' uh, quality of life and build stronger, more resilient neighborhoods. This includes funding for affordable housing projects, homelessness prevention programs, and community engagement initiatives. And by investing in housing and community livability, we're ensuring that the residents, especially those most vulnerable, uh, have access to safe and affordable housing and supportive community environments. Projects like the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, you know, put uh, four million out there uh, in the streets, or not in the streets, but into three specific projects, and have uh, aimed to create and rehabilitate housing for low and moderate incomes. Projects like the one that was approved uh, last year, the Rose Hill Road project that ECD brought forward, does deliver 16 homes for low to moderate income families. The third strategic focus is a infrastructure and community investment. And under this umbrella, we're funding uh, essential infrastructure projects, uh, including improvements to public safety facilities, ADA compliance, upgrades, and stormwater management. Uh, each project under this strategy supports your goal of creating safer, more accessible, and resilient city for all. There were public safety initiatives like the gunshot detection technology and shot spotter, the public safety camera replacements, and those are all aimed at improving safety and well-being of our residents. And investments in infrastructure, such as bridge maintenance, the bridge maintenance program, ADA compliance, and the parks and recreation improvements demonstrate the city's commitment to making long-lasting changes in those areas. We've allocated over $4 million in this strategy to infrastructure improvements, ensuring safer streets, more accessible parks, and modernized facilities for our community. So here's a snapshot of where we stand financially with the ARPA funds as of this month. To date, we've expended over $25 million of it and encumbered nearly $8.6 million of that, leaving us with a remaining unencumbered balance of approximately $6.5 million. Our careful strategic approach to fund management has allowed us to utilize these funds efficiently while remaining aligned with Council's strategic priorities, and we're on track to commit the remaining funds by the end of the year. I do want to note that that 16% of unencumbered funds does not mean it's $6.5 million sitting in, in, in the portfolio. They're already obligated and put towards projects that Council has approved through the process of, of the past two years. They just have not been encumbered under a contract, and I'll speak more to that and how we're going to protect that in a little bit. <clears throat> to maintain compliance with the ARPA regulations, which was about a 600-page rule book from the federal government, 
Uh, we must obligate all funds in this portfolio by December 31st, 2024, and fully expend them by September 30th, 2026. Our strategy includes regular monitoring and uh, flexible allocation of funds and dedicated project management to ensure every dollar is effectively used and no funds are left unspent. Meeting these deadlines is essential to reverting any fund to prevent reverting funds back to the federal government, and we're we're here to make sure it happens. To provide additional flexibility because of that timeline, uh, and ensure that the long-term sustainability of the projects listed on the slide here, we're transitioning certain ARPA-funded projects into the capital improvement plan. And by moving these projects to CIP, we're able to extend timelines beyond the ARPA obligation deadlines, allowing us to complete complex projects without the pressure of returning those funds in that short time. This strategic move requires Council's oversight and approval through budget ordinances and capital project ordinances, which we'll present in due course in, over the next six, seven weeks. With this transition allows the city to continue to focusing on those projects without the constraints of the ARPA end dates. A couple things I'd like to highlight. You can see there's some really big piles of, of funding there. Uh, the Tennis Center with $1.6 million remaining of ARPA that was originally allocated at $5.5 million. As you know, there's been challenges in the construction process of that project to mitigate the risks of losing this funding, we will transition this funds to the CIP in a multi-year project to help preserve the availability of them for the rest of that project. That applies also to all those projects on the list. And then the last one I'd like to highlight is the ARPA contingency. So over the past 24 plus months, we've maintained a contingency for other projects in this portfolio, the 47 that have been active. Uh, it's fluctuated up and down between $900,000 and a million dollars as projects needed more or less. And right now that balance is about $995,000. We're gonna transition that to the CIP for council to then use in the May uh, budget process later, uh, well, in about seven, eight months. <clears throat> so it won't be in ARPA anymore, but that creates a new opportunity for council to have uh, a form of almost a million dollars uh, later in the budget process in May. So we're incredibly proud of the progress we made across the multiple sectors of the ARPA funds, and I just want to highlight some, some things that are worth celebrating. Uh, the city has invested over $5 million in business development alone across the city, $4 million in affordable housing, $6.5 million in recreation improvements, and $5 million in public safety support. And though these investments uh, don't add up to the $40 million, there is a myriad of other projects listed, and in your uh, documents, there's an actual layout of the total cost and budget for each project that was assigned in this portfolio. But through these investments, we were, we've made tangible impact on the economic growth of the city. And the work uh, we've done together has brought positive changes to the community. So the, <laughs> looking ahead, our immediate goal is to ensure that all the remaining funds are obligated by December 31st, 2024. And so myself and the finance team and other entities of this team will be working to put those funds in the right spot so that we don't miss that reporting with Treasury. We'll continue to monthly monitor the remaining projects in the portfolio that have active encumbrances and are actively moving forward to finish their scope and ensure a smooth progress to make any adjustments as needed as, as they finish. And then finally, we are finalizing the transfer of the select projects I showed earlier to the CIP, which will give us additional flexibility in managing timelines and completing these projects on, uh, successfully. In closing, I'd like to extend my gratitude to uh, the mayor and council and, and city leadership. Uh, our dedicated staff and community partners in this process um, have been very patient and played a crucial role in the success of the ARPA portfolio. All of the directors, almost every single department in the city had projects that touched the American Rescue Plan portfolio. I'd also like to invite our consultants, uh, iParametrics, Ben Redifer has been integral in helping us get this and making sure that we have shaped the obligation strategy and in ensuring compliance. And so he and his team have been uh, massively in support of a lot of programs with nonprofits and other entities that ECD has control of to where we have a lot of subrecipient monitoring and pieces like that. And again, I'd like to say thank you for your continued support for the past couple of years on this. Pending your questions. I don't think so. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, I do see Mayor Pro Tem. Well, wait a minute. Got a whole mirage of questions. So, Mayor Pro Tem here and then Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, what I do want to say is, of course, thank you for your report and for the listening audience. Um, 
when we started the ARPA funding and it started out with three different committees that the mayor brought out, I just want the public to know that's listening how well that our staff and our city did this process. By the time we got to DC in 2021 and we were there to ask for money, to not take our ARP money away, we had many of our delegation tell us that we were the only city and the only de delegation from a city that came up that had a plan, had had started implementing our plan, and had no intention of taking any of our money away because we knew that we were going to spend it. So as I go through that, everybody can see what, what has happened and what council and staff have approved and the hard work that they've put in it. But at the end of this, I, I can say in a year, there's probably going to be a story of cities and counties that had to send back their money because they weren't organized and they didn't do the work. And it's going to be in our back door that you're going to see a lot of money that has left our community because staff didn't go in and do the work. So I personally um, wanted to thank you for your hard work and know that when we are up in um, Washington and we go every year, they always commend us on we have our our papers and our homework, and they know that we know what we are asking for. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Councilmember here. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and ditto what Mayor Pro Tem just stated. Um, uh, thank you, guys. Thanks, Brooke, and everyone that's working with you. Uh, we did a fantastic job when you stated that. It just started bringing back memory uh, to me because uh, we were ready. So every congressman, every department, I think we even also met with the Department of Transportation. We wanted more money, like more money, more money, more money. And they were very, very uh, impressed with us, especially with the small um, nonprofit groups that we were working with. As we look at the, um, not sure what page it is, but it has investment and business development page. The very top one is Commercial Quarter Improvement Grant Program, and I see that we have uh, 930000 that was there. And the other one was, well, I guess I'll let you speak on that one. The small Are you, a, sir? You're talking a small business grant program, sir? Yes, sir. That's the, the first item. Uh, and you don't have to do that, state it now, but could you send us a list of those that we were able to help and to invest in. Um, and I know that we are talking about the commercial quarter improvement program. I don't always want to seem like I'm kind of sideways because I always mention Murkison Road, but whatever quarters that it was uh, that we helped with, uh, if you could send us a list of those um, businesses that we invested in. And what was the other one? Oh, yes. Um, where are we and what do, do those initials mean for the Blanton Road extension? I, I don't have it yet. Yeah, it's... Uh, P-U-B-S-W? -P -U Public Services Department, sir. Okay. Can, where are we, are we anywhere with that? That, that uh, project that the on the Blanton Road extension design? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So that project is still underway. It has some remaining design uh, components going. I can't speak directly to the right. full scope of that project, but I can make sure that we get that information to okay. you. Okay. And, and my last question, mm -hmm. Mayor, you, at the... Um, on one of your items up there, because I don't have everything that you have that you showed on the uh, board there, but you had the word uh, committed or com commitment. That doesn't, that just means in order for us to stay in safe position for by December uh, 31st, 2024, all of the funding has to be committed. That doesn't mean brick and mortar. 
or anything along that line. That's correct, sir. So it, it has to be what the federal government has deemed obligated, which is the same. It's a contractual or so memorandum, something to support it. But right. we don't, we won't lose the funding. Right. And so in these projects that you see on the, the slide right now, uh, these have so much remaining scope of that project that we are going to move them to the CIP and transition them out of the ARPA portfolio to pr preserve that funding, but create multi-year projects or the necessary length of the project and then bring that to council to approve and put those ordinances in place. Only because some of these projects have very large sums of money and we right. were concerned at the short, less than 24 months remaining of the award. Right. And it is feasible and allowable under the rules of this program to do this transition at this point. Okay. But the remaining projects will be obligated and all of that funding will be locked in, as you're saying. It doesn't have to be finished. It just right. has to be put in place by the city saying we're doing X. Right. And, and thank you, Brooke. And, and my final question is, I didn't see it on here, but I just saw the, um, the ADA, I thought I saw on here. Did we use or are we using any of this funding for additional bench and shelters? Bus shelters? No, sir. There was no funding that went into the bus shelter and bench program with transit. Uh, there was originally about $375,000 that went into the ADA compliance program. Right. Yeah. And that remaining oh, yeah, balance yeah, yeah. is still yeah. there and, and transitioning over so we can use it in other ADA improvement uh, projects. Okay. I will also speak that council did adopt the ADA transition plan a couple years ago. And this funding, uh, together with the original CIP item that council had on an original annual basis, uh, has eliminated over 80% of the barriers identified in that plan. And so we've actually reduced uh, and increased ex accessibility for our disabled uh, residents in the community. Okay, thank you, uh, Brooke. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, guys. All right, Councilman Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Brooke. Great presentation. Uh, let me make a comment before I get to my question. Uh, I was asked a question uh, on the radio, I think it was Today, I was asked a question. What was I most surprised about, about being on council? What surprised me the most is our staff. How hard our staff worked to take our directive and execute it so well, to maximize every dollar that comes through ARPA to give us all these projects that we have in front of us that we can relate to our constituents about what great things are happening in the city of Fayetteville. So I commend not just you, but your entire staff in leading this campaign to make Fayetteville the all-American city. But my question is about, and I want to make sure I get it right, is about the downtown landscape. Because what I'm looking forward to is that lighting project. I think the, the mayor, did you bring that to council? Mm -hmm. The lighting project about downtown. Because uh, I had to go home this weekend, and I had to drive through a couple of small towns. And I see how they have some of the buildings that are lit up at night that makes it look so appealing as you're driving across a bridge or whatever it is when you can look to the right or left in the horizon to see a city light up like that. Is that what we're talking about when we're talking about the downtown scape? Unfortunately not, sir. Okay. The downtown streetscape focused on the pavers and repairing the street that has uh, high traffic. Um, public services did an exceptional job. They wrapped that project up late last year, mm -hmm. uh, but it did allow them to push further and do some of the repairs that were necessary in the downtown area. Gotcha, gotcha. So, Mr. Mayor, I guess I'm looking for your project to come across. Right, me, you one. and me both, bro. <laughs> All right. Thank you, mm -hmm. Councilmember Thompson. Um, I and I'll just say it. this, uh, Council, before we ask for um, some consensus to receive the report. Um, you know, when, when COVID first hit and the rescue funds came in, um, at that time, the Council really didn't know the rules, and it, it, it Treasury constantly changed it. Uh, and we, we got into committees and we figured it out. So when ARPA was awarded, uh, the next round, we were ready, and, you know, I love this balanced approach that we chose uh, to neighborhood vitality, to businesses, and the infrastructure, and you all found a balanced way to spread that money out and leverage it to, to get other money, and uh, so a lot of this money has been leveraged um, to, to go further uh, to help us do things that we hadn't, uh, wouldn't have been able to do, but it came because Council, you spent the time, gave the direction, and the manager, and uh, definitely kudos to the staff and to the consultant for, for getting it out the door. Uh, but we definitely don't want to be in a position where we're sending any money back. We want more of it, not less of it. So thank you. Council, can we get a motion to accept this? All right. Motion by Council Member Hare. Uh, is there a second? Consensus motion. Davis. All right. Uh, those, Council, those in favor of receiving the report? All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Keep Mayor. up the good work. Council. You guys should be proud of the ARPA work you did, all of you. Thank you, sir. 
All right, Council, looking at 6.04, uh, uh, the review of special use permit. Yeah, who is this, Dr. Newton? No, he's, uh, how's, how's Dr. Newton? How's Dr. Newton? Okay. Okay. Hey, sir, how are you? Good. How you guys doing? Good afternoon, Mayor, members of Council. Um, just kind of give you an update. We came to you in a work session a while back, gone to the Planning Commission a few times. So try and get through this as much as I can because it can be a lot to absorb. So we thought about proposed changes, modify permissible uses and categories in some of these. Um, it's the purpose really is to streamline the development processes. How can we get things uh, reduce delays, improve efficiency where possible, um, and encourage development diversity in the city of Fayetteville. So going back again, a little history, uh, there's varying approaches uh, to special use permits in North Carolina. Uh, Raleigh has a director review, public notice, board of adjustment, uh, quasi-judicial. Charlotte uses uh, prescribed conditions instead of SUPs. Um, aligning with something we have. We have additional standards uh, in our UDO for a number of uses. Um, so that's how they handle that uh, process. Uh, Wilmington issues are denies through the council or board of adjustment resolutions. Uh, they also require a neighborhood meeting and completeness review of applications. We generally do application completeness reviews uh, for any applications that come in. Um, Cumberland County Board of Adjustment handles those special use permits. Uh, and a few years ago, Fayetteville, uh, as I recall, uh, the Board of Adjustment handled uh, most of those special use permits. Um, majority are approved. Um, fewer are denied due to specific issues. Um, there are high approval rate uh, for items like transitional housing, telecom towers, and telecom towers being one that has pages, almost pages of additional standards. So as long as they meet all those standards, they're coming with SUP, they meet all the required findings, it's hard to not approve uh, some of these items. So uh, staff looked at um, considering reclassification of high approval uses that maybe we could permit those as by right or put them in the right zoning classification. Um, that would, again, simplify, reduce administrative burden. Um, like I said just a minute ago, the Zoning Commission Board of Adjustment previously held those duties. Um, so this is kind of the slide that I'm going to talk about here. We have, so on the left, uh, where we have 115 that is, if you're looking at our use table, those are the rows across. So we have 115 <laughs> use types that may have a special use permit depending on what zone it's in. Um, and if you look even further, we have 115 use types and there might be special use permits for all in that category. So that's like 296 total SUPs currently, depending on the matrix and how you look at it. So so just to make sure I'm clear, yep. right? Because this is what kind of prompted all of this. Yes, sir. Me. Yes, sir. So 296, by the time you factor in 115 plus another category you said, what was the other? Uh, yeah, so in the use type, you may have, um, let's just say it's a, it's a townhome. It may be a special use in two or three or four zoning districts. Some uses, it's a special use. Across Every the zoning board, district, right. yes, sir. Versus these other communities, this is their total mm -hmm. number, 58 for Winston, 45 for Durham, 28 for Cumberland County. From what we found, yeah, that's their total number. And it, yeah. No. So, yeah, in the, in the past five years, really those top two are the main ones that you're getting, and those are residential. So you've had 19 um, single-family attached SUPs, uh, well, single-family and two- to four-family. The rest, all the rest is like 22, and you got like one, one of each, one of each, one of each. Now, there are some that might be, you know, a uh, halfway house, uh, auto paint and body, depending on where it is, but it has to be in the zoning district that requires a special use to get a special use. So there might be multiple steps. It might be a rezoning and a special use. You guys have seen that before, too. That's why people feel it's so encumbering, yeah. So... That's a lot. That's a lot to handle. Um, yeah, just feel free. I'm, I'm cool if you guys ask me questions or interrupt. I'm, I'm totally fine. Um, so the category, use types, right? So going through that total, 296, like I said. 
Uh, we looked through, went to planning commission a few times, went to staff. We thought it might be a good idea in some of these cases to move some of these to permitted in certain zoning districts, move to not permitted in some zoning districts because we feel the legislative zoning process is much better for the community and the public. So they would have to go through a zoning commission, then to city council, sometimes it's consent, sometimes it's public hearing. But when you're just going straight to special use, I think there's a lot of issues there when there's, there's, you can do more comments than legislative. Um, you can have comments all the time, but the, the special use comments are, are very strict. You've got to meet the standard, and is it expert testimony? Um, you can have a little bit of more emotion and feel with a zoning case, right? You can have more people show up. So what we're saying is move some of these to permitted, allow them in certain areas, some special use permits that we thought may not make sense, we would allow those in the mixed use uh, as opposed to a special use permit. And then I don't want you to get mistaken by not permitted, they would still be able to get permitted. It would just be a rezoning perhaps or, or some others like that. Um, so how we kind of broke it down and categorized it, some of those that would be low impact, um, Agriculture, government facilities, they're going to have, a lot of these have those additional standards as well. Places of worship, healthcare, transportation, certain commercial uses. We expect that these would have minimal um, negative impacts, support local supply chains. Moderate, you're kind of getting into therapeutic homes, cultural facilities, child daycare centers. They do have standards, there's more scrutiny, traffic, parking, uh, and location wise. And then the moderate to high, still, that's what we have the majority of SUP cases now. Um, in the middle of a neighborhood, turning it into townhomes, duplexes, so on and so forth. Impacts on traffic, parking, infrastructure. Your neighborhood character is going to, to change. Uh, you're more likely to get a whole lot more um, comments and feedback in, in that case. <coughs> Sir. So I got, I got counsel. Councilman Mahadros, and then, then you. Uh, oh, okay. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. How can we compare moving to committed to what the other cities are doing to move to committed? Yeah, we we would have to do um, we'd have to do a whole lot more <clears throat> research into that because the use types, the the nomenclature may be a little bit different. Um, and how they do that and how they break it down category wise. So we could probably pick. Is that why they have a third of SUPs that we have because they, they have moved most of this stuff to committed already? They just, uh, essentially yes. Yeah, they have, they have more, uh, is permitted in the zoning district um, and then you, you buy a property and it's zoned. Let's say ours is um, neighborhood commercial, they may have it something else. It's a special use permit or whatever but we would essentially take that out or allow it as permitted or allow you to rezone to the next because it's a, it's a much better process, we feel, um, and throughout the state, much more public and better public engagement and better process. Good. Thank you, Councilmember Thompson. Uh, Councilman Mahondra. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If there's no other questions, I move that we um, accept the uh, staff recommendations. All right, and all right, there's a motion to uh, accept the recommendations to move and, and reclassify and recategorize per your, your comments and yep. uh, seconded by Councilmember Thompson. Any questions on that? I can't. I, only question I had is what, if this passes, what's the next step? Does it, tell me how it is when, when the council says we want to make a change and it goes back to planning uh, commission, planning and then comes back to us. Right. Yep, yep. Uh, planning commission has to. Uh, they make a recommendation for any text amendments, um, so we, we generally fall back to them. They've looked at this a handful of times, and then um, uh, we were going to bring it back and thought, yeah, let's, let's, let's bring it back to a work session to make sure everyone's kind of on par with that. Yeah, I understand, but yep. what I'm, my, my question is, it went from planning, they looked at it a handful of times, came to us, it's here now. Mm -hmm. if, if this passes and we tell you to do it, it's got to go back to planning and back to us? Good question. Um, that just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so 
this may be an I didn't read question. the full thing in the can, Mr. Mayor. I should have been uh, approved staff recommendations and direct the development of text amendments for submission submission to the Planning Commission. Yeah, I'm asking, is that a necessary, is that a legal requirement or is that something that we do? Because this is, this is like, seems to me redundant. If it starts with them, it comes to us. We're the final authority anyway, and then we're saying send it back to come back to us. Is that a legal issue? It should need to go back to planning. The point, though, is that we don't actually have the text amendment ready, so that would need to come back to council. But it's already gone to planning, so we don't need to, unless council makes changes. So, so Councilman Mahondros, is, is your motion to direct staff to do it? Or do My motion is to move forward the quickest way we can, okay, so legally. That, that, <laughs> all right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to infer that as meaning that you didn't need it to go back to planning, but just to draft if, it. If legally, it if they've already seen it, we're not changing anything. We'll just bring the revised um, ordinance amendment to us for consent. That, that's right. fine. It sounds good. Councilman Thompson, you okay with that? All right, Council. Uh, question, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I just have one question. I'm, I'm seeing I want to go to residential. I want to go to, I just want to make sure when we're voting, because you can read all this, and if you don't do it every day, which I don't do it every day, it can be very confusing. So I know there's people on Council that they read it, and it goes right through there, and they know exactly what we're talking about. So my question is, I just want to make sure with these special use permits and what we're getting ready to vote for, especially in residential, mm -hmm. that I am sitting in my neighborhood and a house has been caught on fire. They tear it down, clean up the area. I believe that somebody should be able to come in if there's enough room, if there's an acre of land, they can put two houses on there. I don't have a problem with that. But I would have a problem, or I shouldn't say, I would like to know, could they put a townhome there? Could they put a quadruplex there? I'm so glad you asked that question. Because we have a scenario just for that. Great. All right. We could have set that up perfectly. I you, segued I think, right into Thank you so much. It. I really appreciate that. I, I got it. Um, so if you look at, if it pops up on your screen there, you'll see criteria requirement for single family SF10 district, mm -hmm. lot area per unit, 15,000 square foot minimum. When you go to multifamily, you're gonna need 60,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then it just, it just kind of moves on and moves on. So you're gonna need extra, if your typical lot size, you're not gonna be able to tear down and build back, but you're gonna need some more space. So if you go single family, Detached minimum lot size is 6,000 in SF6, which is kind of our smallest besides MR. You're going to need 10,000. If you got 10,000 square feet, then you'd be good, but you're, you're, you need you know, 66% larger. So, so everything you're saying I, I get, but mm -hmm. my, my, I guess my real question is, let's say I have an acre and a half lot, because oh, yeah. we know this is an issue in Fayetteville because you know, there's smaller homes on big lots, these homes are 70, 80 years old, and, and, they, and a lot of them, you know, I have one personally. It needs to be torn down. But for me to put one big house on that lot does not make sense. But to put two houses on that lot makes sense. Now, I've gone into the neighborhood. We've discussed it. They're like, yeah, that's great. But if I said, well... It reads in the ordinance that I don't have to get a special use permit and I can put a quadruplex here. That's a different story yes. in the neighborhood. So my question sure. is, sure. do you need a special use permit to come in and put a quadruplex beside a full-blown neighborhood or a duplex in this S SUP? You, if, if you want to move forward and... With the text amendments, it would be no. Um, you'd be allowed, I'll just look, you're allowed to, but do you have the area to do it? Am I, am I getting it wrong? I understand, but yep. the area you're telling me, if I had 60,000 square feet, yep. I could put a quadruplex in there, or a duplex. 
Yes. Okay. So somebody help me out. 60,000 square feet is a what? What? How That's many a acres? About an acre and a half. I mean, an acre and a half. Yeah. Okay. So, 1.377 acres. So if I have a house on an acre and a half in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. I can put a duplex in there without it coming to council. Correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Councilman Thompson, you had your... Okay. All right. So, Council, we've had discussion. Uh, let's tell you for action. Who are we missing? Yeah, pro Tim. All right. Yeah. That's a tough yeah. All right. So let me let me conclude this motion carries seven three. Question. Just last week, the, the only issue that I have is when residents come to us, like we had last week, I think it was last week, and you have a full-blown residential single home community. According to this new amendment, that I know it is, but it's not liked because it's like it, that. It, right. I mean, it's not, it's, you know, nobody like, I don't, people don't like it. So my, 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 my concern is now that if you have at least what, what what's the number, acre and a half? 60,000 square feet. 1.23 acres. So you, tear, you can tear that down mm -hmm. and you can go in there and build a structure outside of the single member home of course it and you're saying that would be able to be done without even coming to us mm -hmm. correct correct and i i have an issue with that i mean the citizens have an issue with that at least some of the ones that i mean last week we, we just dealt with it and they got nothing they got n nothing they just didn't get anything out of it other than to come down and to speak against it. So that's where I have the, the, the issue of being able to go in there and change the development or the makeup of what the community Well, there's a couple, couple things to, to note on that. Um, the state just recently expanded what they consider single family. You know, it used to be single family and duplex, and now it is up to quad. I mean, same same rules. They consider it Sorry. not necessarily... Oh. Sorry. Not necessarily multifamily related. I think those folks the other day that you're talking about were concerned with a multifamily uh, and the impact that three or four hundred families would have on their situation. So, um, but um, but I, isn't this multi multifamily? If you can, uh, no, not a duplex or a triplex. It's all, the state all considers it the same because the, the, the general assembly is moving to take yeah. more of this authority away from cities anyway. Because of stuff well, like that. Yeah, I mean, you know yeah. that, Derek, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, not since right, wrong, and different. It's, the, the discussion is just is just happening. So we want to make it, you know, not complicated to do it. I'm not encouraging you to do one thing or another. I'm just saying it needs to be easy that people understand it. You know. So I think that was the intent, and this may make it easier. But Councilmember Thompson, you had something? I was just going to add, Mr. Mayor, as uh, sitting on a building code for the state. They are loosening some of their restrictions so we can have more housing across the entire state of North Carolina. So that might just be one example that the mayor is talking about. Yep. yep. All right. Well, motion carries. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. All right. So, council move to 6.05. There's some house cleaning, I guess we got to do. Mr. Harmon, how are you doing? Mayor and Council, good to see everyone. Hopefully my item here will be the quickest of the evening because this should be fairly simple. Let's see. So as we do every um, kind of fall and spring, we always come to you with some text amendments, trying to clean some things up in the UDO. 
That's what these are uh, here today. And as your policy dictates, we come to you first, you approve what we're going forward with, and then we take them to the planning commission. They hold a public hearing on it, and then we bring it back to you with the ordinances for you to have another hearing and adopt um, those ordinances. So again, that's kind of where we are today. What, uh, what we're looking at is hopefully uh, with your approval to go forward, we go uh, November or December to the Planning Commission and then back to you in either December or January, depending on how timing works out to bring these issues back to you. Um, we have five items that we're bringing forward. They're all pretty simple. The first one is amending the uh, Historic Resources uh, Commission's requirements for a quorum so that if there are vacancies in there, um, if there are vacancies to seats on that commission, those aren't counted toward the quorum. Currently, they have a seven-member quorum. They have to have four. We have two vacancies at the moment, so we have to have everybody there almost to be able to make just a quorum. If we pass this, we would only have to base the quorum off of five so we could have three people and uh, we've had some issues grabbing quorums here lately. Um, second one is an amendment uh, that was brought to us. Um, it's actually through state legislation, but uh, RULAC uh, kind of put this together for all of us, our communities uh, are, that are involved with it. And it's a uh, some additional standards for wireless communications towers. Uh, and these are in... in uh, for aviation hazards. And so they're about, obviously, the different airports and uh, stuff of that nature around us. Um, the third one, uh, when we implemented the uh, DT1 and DT2 zones uh, in the DT2 zoning district downtown, uh, there's a, a little bit of a miscommunication between our use table and what is in the text. There are some certain streets uh, in the text that allow for uh, you to have a drive-through, and this is just amending the table so that it matches up. Um, and then additionally, the next one is adding <clears throat> specialty eating establishments uh, like coffee shops, ice cream parlors, that kind of thing, to that same list that allows for drive-throughs in a DT2. Um, and then the last one is amending our clear-cutting permit standards, uh, and this would include an exception for sites of one acre or less uh, to provide a smaller 10-foot buffer along the property lines and a 15-foot buffer along right-of-ways. So from you tonight, um, we're just looking to get action to give us a go-ahead to take either all five of these items or any of the five uh, to the Planning Commission and then have them come back to you as ordinance amendments. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. I will go to Council Member Hare. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. Uh, okay, the, the two areas where I have the problems with, well, one questions with, num the number one and Amendment 5. Uh, number one, Amendment 1, uh, they're at what number now? So they have seven members seven, right. on the total board. Mm -hmm. Right now they have two vacancies on that board. So that puts them at five members, but they have to have, because of their quorum, right now they have to have four people there to be a quorum. If we change this to where the quorum is only based off of the a number of uh, People who the number of seats on that commission that are actually at the have, meeting have pe someone filling it at the moment. Okay, okay. So right now it would go down to five, is how many are on it because of the vacancies, and that would allow them to have three people for a quorum. Okay, okay. I I, I understand. I understand that, but we deal with that in the the appointments committee also all the time. So I okay. I'm sort of okay with that. Uh, Amendment 5, I will not be able to support. Me neither. I'm not supporting no open land 
that the people, the, our residents already complain enough that it's not enough of buffer there. And now you're going to clear cut down to an acre and. Uh, you know, uh, in fact, can I interrupt you for one okay, second? Okay, because I'm getting ready to drill it, sir. Yes, yes sir. That, that's, and I want. Uh, Explain it again. Your, the way your comment started is the only reason. These are only for properties that are already one acre or less. So these are small properties and allowing them uh, to clear those properties with a smaller buffer around them. So you're talking about little little tracks, not you would clear down to a size. These are just little individual lots that are already a lake, acre or less. Okay. Uh, and I do appreciate what you were saying, and it, I don't know if I'll be the only one in opposition. I'm still the same with buffers. From the larger lots to the smaller lots, I've got some already within the last three or four years that have been built. I don't know if it was an acre, but it was close to an acre. Uh, and it has the lot where the building is, then it has the uh, retention pond right next to it. And I personally went to the site and ask them, please, even though they had the rules and they could have done all the way up to the rules, hey, these folk really would like for you not to cut all of this down. I mean, just enough where your bulldozer can get around. Just don't cut it down to what the, what the amendment or what the, the policy is. So I just have an issue with taking away uh, buffering uh, and really, really on whatever the, the size of it is because it's the residents to have to deal with it after the fact when we think we are uh, being smart about it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, Mayor Porten. All right. Uh, who hasn't? We've got a whole lot of speakers. Let's see. So that, was, that was Hare. Mayor Pro Tem, is she next? No, I just had it on the zone. Oh, okay. Well, you know the order. Who's next? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it will be... Councilmember Thompson, Green, and Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Harmon, I have a problem with number one and number five also. <laughs> uh, first, let me make it clear, uh, Mr. Chair of the Appointment Committee, didn't we just vote to give alternates to every commission so that they can have a form that the alternate would sit in so if a member wasn't present, that that alternate would be able to attend the meetings and take that individual's place so they would have a form. Didn't we just approve that? Yes, sir, we did. But the only reason I didn't say anything, I, I wasn't, well, no, because that was across the board. Right. So, yes, the answer, the answer, the answer. so if that's the case, Mr. Harmon, we don't really need number one, do we? Well, I'm sorry, we, Madam Attorney, help me out. We, we've had the issue the last two months of not being able to have a quorum and yeah. Do so, the alternates go to every meeting, though? We're going to make a recommendation for the alternates to go to the meeting, so when there's not a quorum, the alternate is already sitting in the audience to, to make sure that they have a quorum. Um, Madam Attorney, you had something? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was just going to note, um, uh, the clerks and I are doing sign language, but we had that discussion about the next committee. Right. It wasn't my understanding that we did that across all of the boards and commissions as to the, the alternates. I think that was our recommendation. That was it. We didn't vote for that. Well, I don't know that we brought that to council then. If yeah, we, we brought that to council. That yeah, it, it didn't come to council It didn't come to council. We, the appointment committee may have done it, but maybe it hasn't come to council yet, but okay. Okay. Well, when it does come to council and get approved, then we wouldn't need number one, correct? Get and, and, and as my suggestion would be, since this still has to go to the planning commission, to vote and allow us to take it to the planning commission, bring it back. If it comes to the top point where y'all do something a little different to where it doesn't need this, then we don't need this. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. Amen. Number... I'm Madam sorry, Attorney, go ahead. Mayor Kobe, Mayor, um, yes, just one additional point on this mm -hmm. number one. Typically, that is how it's done. You don't typically count the vacancies, but our ordinance requires us to do that. So yes. it's a little different than what the standard would be. So mm, that I didn't know. Okay. Yeah, we'll bring we'll bring the whole conversation back to council. 
Uh, number five, uh, we have had discussion over discussion about the aesthetics of our city and what it looks like. Uh, I believe that parks and rec are strung out from all the properties that they have to clean. I think we hired an outside contractor to help us clean up the city the way it looks like. Wouldn't this be detrimental to our efforts in trying to keep the city looking aesthetically good if we was to just cut 10 foot line, 10 foot on properties and 15 on the buffer right of ways and leave the rest of the acre growing to 10, 15 feet tall? Well, this is for, again, this is for clear cutting everything mm -hmm. except for that buffer area around mm -hmm. it. Um, and, you know, that's, we've had a couple of, of times where this has come up where uh, someone wanted to clear a lot that couldn't clear it the way that they were trying to because of the way our ordinance is currently written. And so that's why we're looking at this. Once they go to develop the lot, they could do the same thing and actually, depending on the zone, have less buffering and stuff as well. So it just depends. Thank so, you, Mr. Mayor. So, and, and, you know, in other words, Councilman Thompson, I think, you know, if this was more than an acre, it has to go through uh, DEQ, it used mm -hmm. to be Diener, what have you, uh, mm -hmm. just for the erosion control purposes. Mm -hmm. What we're saying now is you've got a lot of smaller lots that were there were but we still have those those larger standards on it and a lot of times if you have a situation where there are trees on the lot or a person wants to wants to sell it or, or or to develop it or offer it for sale or development you can't really see it you know and so i think this was given the ability for them to you're saying just clear the trees on it with the exceptional it's but stopping at the buffer point yeah, and they still had to come through and get a clear cutting permit, stuff like that. But they still had to the certain uh, trees a certain diameter. They still have to either pay leave to the or tree pay fund. for all of that stuff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. But that doesn't help with the aesthetics of the way our city's going to look. I don't care if you cut back ten feet or fifteen feet. An acre is still a lot of property. Uh, yeah. So what you said, it, it looks better with trees on it than without it. I mean, just wild growth trees is, is what, what I'm talking about. Yeah. 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 All right. All yeah. right. So who's, who's after? Uh, so Council Member Green? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Didn't we, um, City Manager Hewitt, did we not have a discussion, a very lengthy discussion about clear cutting because of what I'm dealing with in two separate areas in my district, one being in Van Story, which is absolutely atrocious, and the other one being in the backside of Tallywood, where Tallywood and Murray Hill kind of meet, where it was clear cut, and we are still dealing with it. They're, the developer is not complying, and mounds and mounds and mounds of dirt have been there for two years. Uh, three years in February. Um, it's it's just ridiculous. Um, while I, I understand this, this is my world I live in every day, I understand this, but could we not deal with that when we deal with the other issues because we were specifically <clears throat> speaking of clear cutting and erosion problems um, because of the tree that fell on Edgewater and knocked the power out because the way that it was clear cut eroded the ground underneath it so that led to the conversations that we had last and when i believe it was directed that we um, refer back to staff to really look at the erosion and i'm sorry i can't i think it was in a work session i'm not sure because i also am on the udo committee and we talk about the same things here which is what much what you guys are dealing with you can't remember which meeting you were in when you discussed it but I know that we had a lengthy discussion around the clear cutting and erosion and DEQ standards and what we needed to do. So a question, the amendment to this is, is what's the current rule now for that if it's less than an acre for clear cutting? Uh, Chester, could you? It, so, so basically, you're still able to do it. It's just the buffer that's been left in, in place. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. I mean, erosion control is erosion control. I don't know. It, you know. Well, I mean, it's but all I'm with you. clearly yeah. hand in hand. That's yeah. why I was asking. 
Yes, yeah. ma'am, there was a lengthy discussion about it. And one of the things about the list that, um, uh, for good or for bad, um, I don't try, try to censor items that the staff, when they're working and looking at the UDO and they're talking to developers, the things that come up through their conversations, we bring them here and let you filter them. Um, but clearly, um, item five is one of the ones that you did raise um, some concern. It was more than one acre, though, that the, it, the multiple lots. But the issue but of they the left clear cutting. No trees. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I, I, I'm still stinging no from that conversation. So they didn't, they didn't comply anyway. They didn't comply. And, All right. Oh, and I'm unfortunately, sorry. we don't have an ordinance that allows us to do too much. Our ordinance is very weak. It lacks a muzzle. So, so again, it, it could be a time to clean, to tighten it where it well, needs to that's, be tightened. And, and I thought that's the direction we were going in, but I can make sure that we go in that direction by a request. Yeah. Okay. So I, can help. I will follow up. Uh, all right. Thank you, Thomas. Councilwoman. So, Councilman Mahondros, <laughs> and then here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I think Diener exists. I think it's a under DEQ, but um, I could be wrong. The um, to Councilman Hare and Councilman Thompson's comments. So we did discuss that in appointments committee. We had a specific ask of staff, specific as I recalled for Fayville next. But then we had a second um, instruction directed to staff for you guys to review all the boards and commissions to see where alternates. Uh, may or may not work, um, and that's from my recollection, but I'm sure the clerks have the minutes. Um, regarding this slide that's up now, uh, particularly number five, and Mr. Mayor, you can help me, um, but I think that was a resident email. There was someone that had a lot that was less than an acre, wooded lot, and I think they had some um, squatters in the way of Oh, unhoused yeah, community, was. there was some tents or something, and he wanted to clear the lot so he wouldn't have the issue. And then there was uh, some back and forth between uh, he and staff versus, uh, regarding what the uh, current ordinance states, and this was the result of that. So I, I don't know that this negatively yeah. impacts it, but that, that was, uh, I think, Mr. Mayor, you may have brought that to the committee. Yeah, uh, so I, I do recall that. It, it was a... Um, property owner that had a business but had w woods behind it and had become an encampment site and he was looking to to cut that back and then uh ran into ran into this challenge here but i mean i think what you're saying and what your concerns are there's some middle ground like it, it that you can have some parameters in it and maybe follow the erosion control recommendations of of diener for smaller lots, you know, because they only get involved if it's an acre or bigger, and you could have something in there that that still left some aesthetic buffers in there, that, but but may allow for exceptions to deal with some of these things like we're talking about. I mean, so it could be something that you could consider, Council. I'll, I'll go to uh, Councilmember here. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I'm, I would like to uh, move forward with um, a motion uh, on this. Uh, before I make that motion, the, another another item of of concern is sometimes the developer will go in and cut it all down, as my colleague is speaking of, and then come back with what the ordinance calls for buffering. You know, they're going to put up a six-foot fence. They're going to plant so many trees when you had such a beautiful, natural thick buffer between the two and that's something that i think that we could uh discuss with the in the udo committee let me know when you're going to have the meeting and i will be there so i move mayor that we remand that uh items one through four uh be amended and that item five be pulled for further discussion within the UDO committee and then brought back to council. Yeah, I, th I think it's here because the committee brought it to us to consider. So, you know, again, um, so we can do the motion and clean up to four if there's no objection to that. I think Mayor Pro Tim had a, had a question. I do. Is it pertaining to number five or number? It is number okay. five. All right. So, so can we do a separate action to agree if if there's no disagreement on one through four, so we can move sure. that? 
Yeah. All right. Sure. So there's a motion by Councilman Harris, seconded by Hondros. Any discussion? All right. Look to you for consensus on one through four only. All right. So moving to num motion carries. So moving to five. Um, with the concerns, Mr. Harmon and, and uh, some of the professional staff of erosion control, so that you don't have a, a you know, they're going to be extreme situations out of whatever legislation we pass. Uh, the one that you talked to, uh, that that you and I had discussed, uh, Councilmember Green, didn't follow the state's guidelines, so you got what you have. So, uh, Mr. Chester, is there any way, if Council is agreeable, that there can be? Uh, some staff recommendation to address erosion control and aesthetics to go. Right now, we've got 30-foot buffers. This took it to 10. Is there any middle ground um, that can be obtained that, that might get us there? Or to allow provisions if, if there is cutting the same, the vegetation on the bottom line, that's not considered clear-cutting like this, this uh, business owner wanted to do to clear a campsite, correct? And Mr. Mayor, if I could, yes, sir. If you don't Mr. mind, please remember that this is just uh, y'all giving us the go ahead to take these items to the planning commission, and they'll flush to it out. eventually come back to you and see what their recommendations are. Uh, it's an appointed board. Do we have whose job it is to look at it? Y'all okay with the planning commission reviewing? I have a question. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Mayor Pro Tem's got a question. <laughs> I'm sorry. She's been patient. I'll come back to you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So my, my question is, I'm hearing that you want to put it to a 10-foot buffer along the property lines on a one-acre lot because it's a small lot. Yes. Okay. Believe it or not, I don't have a problem with the 10-foot buffer. I, re I really don't have a problem. I understand your concern. That's apples and oranges. Um, so the 10-foot buffer isn't an issue with me. And a lot of reasons is what came to you is that when you do have an empty lot, there's a lot going on that you can't see. So it basically helps us out in a lot of things. It helps the police out. My question is, and... And I'm just trying to wrap my head around what we were talking about last time and this time. I'm hearing that an acre is small. And, you know, so we need a 10-foot buffer instead of a 15-foot buffer to be able to build on it and everything. And I agree with that. I have no issue with that. But my issue in my head is that a 1.2 acre, I can put a quadruplex on. 1.377, I can put a quadruplex on in the middle of a neighborhood, and will there have to be any buffers? Well, I, I'm asking him the question. I know the answer. I'm asking for the question. It is two different things, but we're talking about buffering. We're talking, I'm, I'm asking Mr. Harmon, please. Yes, you, you are right. They are two different things, but they both follow the same process. So they're still going to come back to you for a public hearing. It's still going to be this council's decision one way or the other which, how both of those items flush out. So, uh, so what I'm hearing, what I, you know, I know we did a consensus, but what I heard was if my next-door neighbor's house burns down, and they don't want to rebuild there. They can build a quadruplex right beside me without us. The special use permit will not come through the city council, and we do not need a buffer. Well, again, so, you know, the, these were two different items. That, that was the first one that, that uh, Mr. Deaton spoke to you about. But, again, just remember that when those special use permits come back to you, you don't have to adopt all of the changes as one package. Okay. Uh, you can okay. always pull out individual, something you're not comfortable or the whole uh, okay. that, that, That's. I appreciate you answering the question, but that's not what I asked. But, my net, but what I'm going to ask, and I'll let it go from there. We're talking about one-acre 
pieces of land. So what I'm assuming I'm hearing is this is commercial. It's whatever. It's whatever. So if it's yeah. in the neighborhood and you're going to put a quadruplex in it, it has to have a 10-foot buffer. Because my next door, my back door neighbor doesn't need them. So, so two, two things. Not, so not they're doing. just talking about cutting all the trees off. So the state handles it at an acre plus. The, what you're talking about, an empty lot that's already cleared, is are setbacks. I, I understand that, but okay, let's and and these are questions. You know, we are voting on things right. that are affecting people's lives, so yeah. we need to make sure that we know what the what we're voting on. Mm -hmm. My question is, I have. A I have a lot next to me. Mm -hmm. I don't. I'm just in theory. That is wooded. Mm -hmm. It's 1.5 acres. It's 1.378, right? Mm -hmm. So then I, I come in and I say, okay, I buy that piece of property and say, I'm going to put a quadruplex there. When I cut down the trees, I know I can't clear cut. Mm -hmm. We know that's a no-no. Do I have to have a buffer if I put a quadruplex behind my back door neighbor? So what this number five is, is just clearing a piece of property. It's not developing that property. When it comes to developing the property, and uh, Mr. Green can expound on it, but I... Uh, Okay, thank you. All right. All right, Council, any other questions? If not, uh, oh, Council Mahadras, you don't want to go home? I've got a motion. So um, I'm trying to think of one, and I'm sure there's one that exists, but most recorded platted subdivisions do not have lots that are larger than an acre. Matter of fact, most of them don't have a lot that's larger than a third of an acre. So. I'm not saying it's impossible that there would be a 1.377 or larger lot in a subdivision, but it's highly unlikely. Um, but Mr. Mayor, if um, there's no more questions, I'm prepared to make a motion um, that we direct staff to take number five to planning commission. Huh? You, you did one through four, didn't you? You did one through four, right? Okay. Yeah, I did. All right, so maybe I'll. Yeah, I was just going to have staff um, work on number five and take it to planning commission. So the erosion, I mean, we have uh, stormwater that takes care of that. The, the aesthetics, your, your uh, version of aesthetics and mine, and, and you poll 100 residents, it's subjective. So what you think looks good, someone else may think looks terrible and vice versa. I don't know how you regulate something that's subjective. Well, I, I, think, he's, I think he's saying buffer, right? Right now it, it says buffer. Buffer, the purpose, I think the, one of the purposes was aesthetic, but... I think it's buffer is what he's what he's saying, not necessarily an opinion. So you want me to amend the motion to for staff to work with number five, uh, moving forward to to planning commission with a twenty foot buffer. I'm okay with that. All right, that's the motion. Councilman right. Thompson seconds. So let me try to understand uh, the motion. So this is pertaining to number five. Was it to send it to planning or was this for to staff to work on it, send the revisions to planning and come back to us with a 20 foot buffer? Okay. All right. All right. Is the second? All right. Now that motion. Acre or more than I, I am, um, but on, in there, Council Member Thompson, I am because I had already been working on the erosion piece for a council member request that I'm going to submit soon. 
around our ordinance or lack of. Sounds good. Right, or lack thereof. <laughs> We're ready for the vote, Mr. Mayor. Uh, all right, I had another question, Council Member uh, Benavente. Mr. Harmon, uh, if the planning board decides not to come back with a recommendation of 20, we can't force them to come back with that recommendation, can we? No, I mean, they could come back with any recommendation. Right. But so then what are you guys doing? When it comes to y'all, y'all can, you don't have to abide by their recommendation. Yeah, so, so we should just so. follow what the staff said, approve it so they can go to them and come back to us. This isn't the time to quabble, squabble over the specifics that don't matter. Uh, all right. Uh, okay. So thank you. All right, Council, look to you for action on the Hondros Thompson consensus motion. Say it again. Motion maker, can you say it again? Five, which states amend the clear cutting permit standards to include an exception for sites of one acre or less, provided only a instead of a ten foot, twenty foot buffer along the property lines, and uh, fifteen foot along the right of way. Bring it to 20 and to bring it to planning commission, then come back to council. All right, so did you, you vote, council member? All right, who are we missing, Jen? Council member Davis. All right, so motion carries. So, council, can, you, can we consider something? When, uh, so maybe if this came out of UDO, let me just follow it for a minute. Came out of UDO, came to us, we discussed it, we're gonna send it back to planning. Who's going to discuss it? Bring it back to us for action. Can't we eliminate some of that? That if it that if it come, I understand the recommendations got to come from planning statutorily. Is that is that how they're involved? Um, the, Why the, can't it go to planning and let them hash it out on the front end? If go ahead. The Madam. statutory piece is the public hearing piece for some of it, but I had a note to review the process for this, so I have that. Okay, because it this. Takes a long, and each time we did a text amendment, it's like back and forth for a minute. But good work, Council. Um, yes. All right, so moving to paid parking, we've got some interesting folks back there that's been waiting patiently. I see Miss Ebony and Bianca and some of the other folks uh, that are looking for an update on this thing that I thought was updated already. So he looks excited to talk about it. We are too. <laughs> How you doing? Uh, I'm doing wonderful. I'm gonna try and try and get you guys out over here early. That's what I'm talking about. Yep, yep, yep. Hope some others catch that spirit. Well, it's funny because uh, I got the next presentation after this as well. Oh man, okay. <laughs> that should be. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brian McGill. I'm gonna go ahead and grab the keyboard here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the parking program uh, review, uh, just real quick. Uh, this is the recent parking program history. Uh, before 2019, we had McLaren as our parking ad advisor and consultant. Uh, 2019 and 2020, uh, we reduced the event rate and we also switched enforcement. And then COVID happened in 2021, that's whenever we paused enforcement. 2023, we reduced the enforcement hours. In 2024, we reduced enforcement hours again. Uh, for those not familiar with our parking enforcement in the downtown area, uh, right now we are running it Monday through Friday from 9 to 5. Weekends are free. Uh, our special event rate is $5 a day. On-street parking is not subject to special event rates. The on-street rate is $1 an hour with no max, and service lot and parking deck rates are $1 an hour with a max of $5 a day. Uh, the parking decks also have the incentive of having the first hour free. And then this one might not be known to a lot of citizens, residents of the downtown area, or people who come down here frequently. However, we do have a program that has a monthly permit for $50 for the parking spaces down here. And we also have a hospitality permit, which is $25 for a parking space per month down here. Uh, for the logistics of our program, we have about six and a half acres of surface lot parking. And this accounts for approximately 1,800 city maintained parking spaces. Uh, the Franklin deck <clears throat> has about 295 parking spaces and the Hay Street deck has 363 spaces. Whenever it comes to the maintenance of those decks, 
Uh, the consultant walks them a minimum of three times a day. You'll often find that they walk them more often. Uh, the minor maintenance, things of basic general cleanliness, picking up trash, blowing the decks, and uh, you know, t taking the trash out, that's handled by the consultant. Uh, if there is some slight graffiti repair, things of that nature, then they might call up Parks and Rec to help repair that. But whenever it comes to larger items that have to be repaired, like the fire suppression system, the fire sprinklers, then we have to cons uh, contract out to a third party to repair those type of systems. Uh, additionally, power scrubbing of the decks is performed on a quarterly basis. Now, as part of this presentation, it was asked to uh, review the parking contract, and whenever staff review the parking contract, it can basically be summarized into four main areas. And that, those four main areas are summarized into operations, administration, equipment, and maintenance. Now, the operations, they basically cover staffing and salaries, supplies, and management. The administration is your things like the online program, the processing, and the management fee and profit. Your equipment are the vehicle fees and software and data fees. And then your maintenance is, you know, the actual performance of the duties and outlining exactly what they're going to be doing and what the city is responsible for doing. Uh, something to note that was uh, made clear to us whenever we're talking about the contract, the vehicles that you see them use for parking enforcement, those have been paid in full uh, as of the end of this calendar year. So we're no longer being charged for those vehicles. Now, in regards specifically to the contract terms regarding maintenance, because that's been kind of a hot topic issue surrounding our paid parking program, uh, it's, it's spelled out in our contract terms that the commercial sweeper and scrubber machine lease, that they use a leased scrubber truck for cleaning the parking decks. And that's what they use on the quarterly basis to go in there and scrub the parking decks. They also spell out the actual things that they do on a daily basis. And that is things like uh, the daily trash pickup and removal of decks, sweeping, blowing, power sweeping, power scrubbing. Uh, they also perform things like graffiti removal, uh, pressure washing whenever uh, it's needed. And they also help facilitate uh, contractual repairs. So if they notice that there's an issue with elevators or electrical issues or an HVAC issue, they'll reach out to us or Parks and Rec, and then they'll help us reach out to the, uh, to the vendors and help us basically repair the systems of the parking decks. On the city side of things, we're repair for the big items, the things like structural repairs of the decks. Uh, the sidewalks, HVAC items, uh, the fire suppression system. If it happens to snow here in Fayetteville or ice, then we're also going to be responsible for making sure that the deck remains free of it or we close off the top of the deck, as we've been known to do. Uh, we're also responsible for, essentially, the, the tax of the property that the deck sits on. So, uh, so that's spelled out in the contract as well. Now... In terms of what's happening recently with the current program, uh, our contract is scheduled to expire at the end of next calendar year. Uh, right now, our departments and the consultant are working to address the main concerns, and those concerns are surrounding the maintenance and uh, maintenance capabilities, some security options, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, and then utility optimization, and we're also working on uh, enhanced meetings and communication to address uh, issues such as the gate arms and uh, daily trash and maintenance issues. Um, and something to, something to note, which not a lot of people might have considered, with the Crown Event Center being constructed where it's being constructed at, we're expecting that the Franklin Street Deck utilization is going to increase. This is because the Cumberland County parking lot, which provided free parking for the downtown area, is no longer going to be available. They have to park somewhere. Yes, the county is building a parking deck. However, the city also has a parking deck directly across the street from the event center. And depending on the popularity of the events there, depending on the availability and the time that they're going to have the county parking deck up, and depending on when construction occurs, then the utilization of the Franklin Street deck is expected to increase as events occur at the uh, event center. Now... 
One of the other things that we like to do here in Fayetteville is look at what other cities are doing. I've, I've noticed that that's kind of a trend. Um, and so I took a gander at what the other parking programs are going on at other cities. And you'll kind of see a trend happening here with hours of, hours of enforcement. Uh, practically all other cities in North Carolina that have a paid parking program, all of their hours of enforcement start earlier than ours do. And half of them have hours that run later than ours do. A third of them also, or almost a third of them, also have uh, enforcement on Saturdays as well. We also have one of the lowest uh, street rates and also uh, one of the lowest event rates. Essentially, we are on par with places like Winston-Salem and Boone. Uh, and then whenever we're talking about the financials of the downtown paid parking program, uh, I'm going to call Kimberly Leonard up here to assist me with uh, this information. Hello. On the top half of this sheet, um, you'll see the financials for the first four, last four years of history and the current budget. And it's broken into surface lots and parking decks. And it's also, you can see the number of spaces there. Mm -hmm. You will see for the parking decks that that number is 129 spaces higher than um, what was presented on a previous slide. And that is because here we are counting the 129 spaces that are currently blocked off on the top that are not being used, they're being reserved for when there's um, resident spaces up there. And so when you take your expenditures and you divide the number of parking spaces. Currently for 24 for the surface lots, it comes to a cost of about $926 a year per space. And for the parking decks, 565. If you don't count those 129 spaces, it would be 675 um, per year per space. The bottom half of the sheet breaks out your revenues and expenditures. At the top, those revenues um, add up down here to where it says current parking lots and decks. The additional miscellaneous revenues, general fund transfer and violations are in, in addition to the revenues that you see at the top for the surface lots of parking deck. And then you'll see the expenditures broken out below that you will note in the 25 budget year, the current budget year, that there are no transfers or debt um, allocated to the parking fund. There is other debt that was um, not being posted here, but it's been posted in the general ledger over the years. And for 25, that amount was 1.5 for this current budget year, and for 26, that would be an additional 1.6 million um, in debt that you don't see there. Yes, sorry. So I'll repeat that. For 24, there's 1.6 million in debt that's being paid for out of the general fund that's, that you don't see there for the park index. And for the current year, about 1.5 million. And so when you, look, when you look at this, you will see the first year was a loss. But if you look up at the revenues at the top, there was a, gen, a considerable general fund transfer for the first three years. If um, that, the general fund had not assisted with the park and deck, you would have seen um, at least a half a million dollar loss all the way across there. Is this both decks or is this uh, Hay Street or Franklin Street? It's Hay Street and Franklin Street together. Combined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I was talking about the debt, the, that's made up of two different um, payments, and one averages currently a little <laughs> over 400000 a year. That payment will be um, end in twenty six. And the one that currently is averaging about 1.1 million will be paid off in um, 38. 
like 2038. All right. So from there, uh, we're going to go over some kind of the recommendations. Um, and these are basically the, some options and recommendations to consider based on our understanding of council's appetite. Um, One second. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Mary, um, it's come to my attention that we have not shared this with the downtown um, alliance and with the Cool Springs district. So I would ask you all just to ask questions on what we've covered so far and allow us to present these recommendations to them before we bring them to you. I apologize to them for um, not doing that earlier, but we um, have worked very closely in partnership. They're in your packet, and so you can see them, but um, we um, did not do that I'm before. I've seen them. I'm already getting nice emails about them. Well, I, I, I'm not getting those, but um, I can feel. <laughs> I'd be glad to forward yeah, them. That's okay. No, no, thank you. No more additional records. But I think that the purpose of the presentation um, was to, number one, respond to questions that council had related to security and cleanliness. Uh, yeah. Okay. And so we have that, um, and we owe you more information back on the parking financials, um, uh, a more defined presentation on that and where we move, uh, move uh, going forward with that. But um, primarily, um, it, Mayor Council, we have to answer the question on anything in your packet, but if we could look at just the, those first couple, that'd be great. Well, I did, did have some questions, and, and probably uh, Ms. Ebony may get, tied into this a little bit. I sat back there. Um, so as we look at the hey, the Franklin Street deck, um, you know, I don't, I don't even want to get on my soapbox about Hay Street's deck and where that is, but the, the Franklin Street deck. Now, it's my understanding it's in the contract that the city has with the parking contractor. PwC claims ownership of it when it's convenient. But when, when we're dealing with the calls and the emails about, you know, it's in their rent to their tenants of the building that they manage for us. But when there are calls about the graffiti, about the after hours uh, activity that takes place up there, the security of it, they tell their tenant, even though they collect rent for it, that it, it's a city problem. City has a conversation with, with you guys about it. Talk to me a little bit. I'm confused. I, I know there are parking decks all across the country that have the, the barrier gates that are not able to be, you get out your car and you lift them up, right? They still have to comply with emergency rules that there's an emergency process. But why are, are we the only ones with that type of gate? Or it, is, it, is it the contractor's position that that is the only kind of gate that's available that keeps people out? Because that one... They just lift it up after hours, and I know when you go, I go to parking decks in other communities, they don't have that. So, so, Ebony, Ebony, if you want to come up here, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's because the microphone up here is re recording for the playback later. Oh, okay. As well as the public is listening. How you doing, Miss Ebony? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. Okay, so with the parking decks, there is other equipment that could have been purchased by the city. So keep in mind, outside of the parking contract, the city went out and decided what equipment they would use. So we bought a cheaper version. Right? That's what the city mm. chose to do. So we didn't that. choose mm. that equipment, nor was it the equipment that we, as the parking contractor, recommended. How, how much of a problem are you running into with that deck with after-hours activity and all the stuff that goes along with not having a secure interest. <laughs> so I've been managing the parking system for a little over 11 years now. I used to get the phone calls myself, and I would be down here at 11 and 12 o'clock at night, and then I wised up. So when you're stuck in that parking deck or something happens in that parking deck, your first recourse is to call the police, because when you call the police, it gets put on the radar. It shows that we called. It shows that there's an issue. If you only decide that there's an issue that you never say something about, then nobody knows that there is an issue. So it, it happens a lot. 
and they can and understand. Not, not just getting stuck. I'm just no, saying. Understand that when somebody goes in there and they're up on the top level, racing around, causing all kind of damage from graffiti to the racetrack strips that we have to try to scrub out of that deck. It is a all the time issue. It happens quite often. There was for a little while some security that we had that was um, through the police department, but it was a private security. That That is the best thing that you can do is have eyes in there specifically overnight because we're here Monday through Friday from 9 to 5. You don't need extra people during mm. that time. You need someone overnight to – because that's when the trouble happens because most of the people that are out late at night like that are – so, Council, I, I'd ask as, at the end of this if, if there's any action to consider, if we could consider getting uh, some bid prices on that piece. That that's, Get a lot of calls on that. Then you have a lot of people who are who, who we're encouraging to park in the deck when there's activity, and that's going to increase with the performing arts if there's not a replacement deck or when that parking goes away that, they're, that they've, that they've uh, taken offline. The safety of these decks, uh, and I'll, I'll end it with this, uh, Hay Street, real quickly. I know that the uh, Junior League organization, you know, my wife's a part of, had a meeting at Segra, and, you know, a few of those ladies, I had to walk about three or four of them to their cars who parked in the Hay Street deck because they had to walk and step over people and around people. It was dark. There were – lighting wasn't great, and, and – uh, but since then, they've, they've done something with the lighting, but – these these decks, uh, particularly for ladies at, at night that are visiting our downtown, we want to make sure they feel safe going to and from the, the cars. So if we can uh, talk about that or at least get some bid prices to talk about what that looks like. And Mr. Mayor, we actually have um, our security person. He's probably listening to us now. Um, Rob Robertson um, working with um, the team to come up with that from LPRs to cameras. Um, I think the equipment that we talked about um, um, is at the end of its useful life anyway, and so it was it's probably time, but um, we hope to have that and can bring that back in, in time as well if there's an interest, I think, in um, reporting back on this later, if that's something that... Um, um, <laughs> Talking about security guard for the deck, Mark. All right. All right. So, uh, don't, don't take the bait, Evan. All right. Uh, <laughs> Councilmember Andros and then Davis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have two questions. One on slide three. Um, there's mention of a monthly uh, per space permit versus a hospitality permit. Can you uh, talk to me about the difference in those two? A monthly, per a hospitality first permit is a permit for um, employees of the business owners making less than a certain amount of money per month. So gotcha. there's only two locations that do that. So you can't just park anywhere that is not for the Franklin Deck, that is for the Donaldson lot, as well as the Maiden Lane Bridge area. So they're kind of in areas that you can get to where you need to go. Um, the monthly permit is for anybody else who opts to do a monthly permit. If you have a business down here, if you work down here, you can get a monthly permit for $50 per month, and you can you usually choose the location that's closest to your business. Thank you. And then on slide eight, uh, da -da -da. so which uh, at the top there says contract scheduled to expire in 2025, which contract specifically are we referring to? Mine. <laughs> the, uh, the one with we the, currently with, have with the with contractor, yes. and um, I'm sorry, I don't know if these questions are directed to you. I'm just asking staff in general. Um, it, what month is it? Like December 31st, 2025, or is it? It's December 31st, 2025. However, it is on a month to month. Uh, it's on a month to month renewal path, so we have the option to essentially cancel it uh, at our discretion. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Councilman Mahondros, uh, Councilman Davis, and Benavente. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I recommend that we table this discussion until January, uh, January 6th, to be exact, um, so that we can have more discussion and so that staff can talk to the downtown business owners as well about it. So that is a motion that I have on the floor. Second. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. I do have, still have a couple other hands on it. Councilman Benavente, you had something?
you sure we don't want to just call 911 like Ms. Ebony said and just rely entirely <laughs> on the law enforcement? Are we sure we want to do alternate okay. approaches? Uh, it definitely is an option. We encourage. Let's just have, let's just pay the cops more it'll, to it'll patrol be a them more. non-hostile response. Let's do more money, more police only. All right. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that. Is that a motion? All right. All right. So, Councilman, any other discussion on that? Councilman Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm glad he brought up the question about money because mine is about money. Uh-oh. If we are 1.5 in debt last year and 1.6 in debt this year, what do you suggest we do to get out of the red? <laughs> don't, don't take debate. Um, what I would say, Council, is um, this has been an issue that I can speak for Mayor Pro Tem. Um, and the mayor have had since we um, started looking at this in 2015-16. Uh, um, and um, one of the things that um, we do is that we are very responsive um, to people as we should be. But in how you pay for the parking is someone has to pay. And every time that we revisit the rates, every time we revisit the zones, every time we revisit the enforcement times and hours, even we started off, we had a special event rate of $10 per car. And that lasted, how long, Mayor Pro Tem, Mayor? About a month. About a month. And that cut your special event revenue in half. Um, recently, um, uh, the council to respond to concerns about post-COVID and trying to get people back downtown and questions about enforcement hours overnight, which, again, the numbers didn't pan out. That it was making a ton of money. That's one of the reasons that council um, sponsored and changed uh, the enforcement hours as well, being very responsive, but also it wasn't making a ton of money. But all of those things eat into your rate. But one of the biggest issues, and the staff was very careful, this was when Kelly Oliveira was assistant um, budget director and Tracy Broyles was here. And I'm not sure if, how many of you actually worked with Tracy um, Broyles, um, but we had a, a very knock, knock down, drag out fight in manager's office with that budget director. Because before we signed the contract with Republic, we made it very clear to council. We did a budget amendment in the middle of the year to make sure that council understood that the enforcement contract with the nation's largest um, um, parking enforcement um, agency that was hired specifically to give us recommendations on how to manage our parking, um, that it was going to be much higher than McLaurin. McLaurin was like $101,000 a year. I, I remember that. That was just that um, uh, profit piece or the administrative piece. And um, we, we're getting a lot more services and from this. But to your answer, to question, short answer is, is that when we get to January and we come up, as the mayor said, with the new equipment, we address the security issues. When update, I'm not sure if one of the recommendations is we take a look at updating our parking management plan, we would come up with a, um, a budget for the parking. And um, we would need to give it enough time to actually show paying off. But the deck is not scheduled to be paid off. I think you said, uh, Kimberly, it's 2038, the deck. Mm-hmm. And what um, some may not know as well is that the council at the time pledged to the public that no taxes would be used to build a stadium. We would use it. And so part of that, we were relying on parking revenue. And so every time we make a change to the parking program, we are extending the time in which other resources are having to be committed to pay off the debt for the stadium. Um, but there are other things afoot. But um, that's why I think if we, this would be a great dedicated um, work session topic for the budget. But if you give us until January as the motion on the floor, we'll have an opportunity to talk to our partners at the back um, and Ebony and her team as well and come back with some interim recommendations for you that you might wish to consider. Let me just have one follow-up question for you, Mr. Manager. And and staff, when we had that meeting in January, is there any way that you can project on how much revenue would be uh, gained when the new Performing Arts Center is built so we wouldn't have to make the changes if it would take us out of the red? We can take a look at that. Um, we would be able to, uh, it's not scheduled to open until 2026. Six. Six. Or, or, 26 or 27? Twenty-seven. Not, not sure, but he said something that sparked yeah. the question. Uh, but, but what we can do is um, every special event that you would have downtown um, would be five dollars a car, um, and um, we can we can try as best as we can to project some of that. Um, uh, but um, 
but we, we, we will we'll give it our level best, Kimberly and, um, and Brian. We'll do that. And Evan, we'll do Thank that. you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. So I'm going to go to Mayor Pro Tem, but you said something a minute ago. There, was, there were how many uh, spaces not being used in the Hay Street deck? 29. Huh? 29. So 120, how much revenue are we missing with those not being online? And why are they not online, the 129? Um, they're not online right now because, except for special occasions, there's no demand for 129 spaces on the top floors. Um, as well as there are some of it is still blocked off um, for security purposes as well. Um, and that was one of the considerations um, that when you have people you have who can go all the way up, they will go all the way up. You don't have the elevator. Yeah, so the elevator installation should help with that, I'm sure. It, it should help with that indeed. Yeah. All right. Um, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Mayor. Um, so I have a question about the gate. We talked about the gate. Is that the gate? Is that the gate that was built when the parking lot was built? So if we're referring to the Franklin Street deck. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So when the Franklin Street d deck was built in 2012, mm -hmm. that wasn't the original arm there. That was re the arms that are there now were replaced in 2019, 2020. Hmm. So it's not the original arms. So it's not the original no. arms. It is not. Okay. Is that the original arms were actually made of wood, so they would just drive through those. So these are So we did metal. an upgrade. We did upgrade. Okay. So we, we did. did upgrade, yes, but did. as time moves on, we realize that we should have upgraded a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yes. We got the basic of the basic. Yeah, yes. we got the basic minivan and not the one with the double doors. Yes. Okay. I'm sure if with Designa is the one who does those gates. You can, the, what you have now, the equipment you have now can be retrofitted with the upgraded gate. Okay, that's good to know. So yes. the gate that we have is not completely, we no. can retrofit it. Yes. Okay. Um, and just a, a point, you know, I know that we're not using the top of the one on Hay Street, but if everybody can recall, that might not be a bad thing because there were nights that we had children up at the top floor late at night standing on top of That's on taking the Franklin their. Street yep. Deck. Okay, let's not confuse the two. The Franklin Street deck, we, we utilize those 98 spaces. I understand that. Street but though I'm saying it's not a bad thing because they could go over to the Hay Street and do the exact same thing. Yeah, but the. K Street is not as open as Franklin. A absolutely. They but enjoy Franklin. They had a great time up there on that top floor. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. All right. So there's a motion on the floor. Uh, I think by Councilmember Davis to move this to January. All right. All right, Council, look to you for action on that. If there are no more questions on that. All right. Uh, who? Okay. Motion carries 9-1. Who's voting in opposition? Councilman Banks, McLaughlin. Okay. All right. Moving to. So what now? Yeah. All right. Moving to traffic management. DJ here. Uh, Councilman Hill's got a motion for that one already. Good afternoon, everyone. I was waiting, waiting for the presentation slides to show up on screen. Yeah. Good night. Good evening. <laughs> good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Yeah. All right. Uh, so this is the second one of the double header. Uh, again, my name is Brian McGill. Uh, this one is about the RTMP signature process review. This one hopefully is also going to be a little bit fast. Uh, might be a little bit more uh, lively, engaging session at the end of this. So. The presentation goal for this one is how to foster citizen engagement and participation with the RTMP. A little bit of history on this. We have brought uh, information surrounding the RTMP to you all multiple times uh, in the past uh, few months. Uh, and just briefly here, last month we did bring you a presentation and uh, we do have a few presentation responses to you 
uh, before we get into the meat and potatoes of some of our proposed uh, suggestions. So there were some responses and uh, some comments that were made in the presentations whenever we came here last month, and I wanted to provide some responses to that here today. Uh, so the first one, what happened to the rubber speed hump that was cheaper than the asphalt option? Uh, I sent an email earlier today. I don't know if everybody has seen that email, uh, but I just wanted to kind of provide a very basic summary for that. There is a rubber speed hump option that is cheaper than an asphalt option. Uh, it bolts into the pavement, and it has problems with longevity, maintenance, and durability, and liability. The main issue is they don't last as long as asphalt. Uh, it requires a constant maintenance, and it has a potential to throw a bolt into cars. Um, all right, all right. Councilman Mayor. Oh, okay. I was <laughs> all right. I was just they right. The yeah, they were stuck in the voting. Uh, I can wait till he was done. I just wanted to okay. echo my as soon as possible. Okay. All right. Um, and just and some of these have been answered in previous uh, questions that were asked during the presentation, but I'm just going to go back over them again here. Are new speed humps installed through council authority or administrative policy? Council approved the RTMP and staff administrators policy. Uh, are speed humps that are paid for by community brought to council for approval? Uh, the summary is no. Uh, the RTMP gives us administrative policy to basically go out there and install it. Um, who does SS4A survey and does it include neighborhoods with one way in and out? Uh, the summary for that is CTP provided the one way in and out neighborhood study. SS4A is not going to do a comprehensive neighborhood review. They are just going to review the RTMP program overall and come back with suggestions. Uh, yes. Uh, can a neighborhood be exempt from the speed hump petition signature process? Is that something SS4A could change? Currently, there is not a way for a neighborhood to be exempt from signatures. Uh, if SS4A determined that it was best practice to allow this, then it will come back with SS4A recommendations whenever they come back to council a year from now. Uh, are we partnering with the state and county for funding? Uh, SS4A is federally funded with a city matching portion. Uh, but stakeholder involvement does include NCDOT, Cumberland County, Fort Liberty, FAPD. Uh, we do have uh, pedestrian and bike advisory groups. We have a smorgasbord of people participating with us. Uh, why are speed humps the only option? Is it due to funding? No. It's because speed humps are the most, one of the most effective tools to reduce speeding. They're mo they are just very cost efficient and cost effective. Uh, are there other alternatives given to communities besides the speed hump? Uh, for, so, in summary, speed humps and stop signs are the only things citizens can request. However, if other things come up whenever we're reviewing their area, then w staff can go out there and make other changes. But that's not something that citizens can request. It was asked how many have been installed this year. I misspoke last time in the last presentation. I said zero last time. Uh, there has been six this fiscal year across, their, across two locations. Uh, it's 14 this calendar year. And then uh, our renters are owners that have to sign uh, both, but owners override renters if there's a dispute for the signature. And will SS4A reference the number of speeding tickets issued by FAPD and determining recommendations FAPD is a stakeholder in SS4A, and we're going to determine uh, the level and gran granularity of their involvement in the process uh, as the program goes forward. I also want to provide some data clar clarification on this. The RTMP is done through the little black tubes that you guys drive over in the road. We don't use radar feedback signs. The signs that you guys see in like Hay Mount when you're driving down the road and it's flashing the speed that you're driving saying, hey, you're going 40 and a 25, slow down. That's not us. We're the little black tubes that you drive over saying, I wonder what that was. So I just want to make sure that everyone's oh, aware yeah, of that. Flashing. That's uh, law enforcement. Whether it's FAPD or sheriff, it depends on the jurisdiction that you're in. But uh, typically, almost it's always going to be law enforcement. 
They can and often do provide that information to us. However, our program, the RTMP, uses the black tubes the majority of the time. It's a, it's a matter of cost. My understanding was that in order to, you know, do some kind of data comparison that you have the tubes out without any sort of radar or without any sort of blinking, flashing uh, number for like a week or so, and then you do turn it on, and for some reason that gives more statistically, you know, reliable data. Are you saying that that doesn't always happen and that only happens sometimes? Or Because I thought uh, that was every time. So that is dealing with radar feedback sign. That is a law enforcement item. That's not the RTMP. That's not the traffic services group. That's not So any time that um, someone asks for their neighborhood or their street to be considered for a speed, uh, some kind of, you know, uh, speed bump or, 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 or speeding mitigation uh, attention, you guys will go out there with a speed sentry, and you're saying now that the speed sentry is something totally separate. That's it's a totally separate item. The only thing we go out there with are the little black tubes that you guys see on the screen. Okay. Well, I, I'll, maybe I'll just ask this now because since you're doing a really good Q and A or, or frequently asked questions, I need someone else to to I guess re-educate me because I've been sharing with people that it is a process, and I'm, I've, I feel like I have an email that that explained it to me. That's the only reason I got it that way is that you request a speed sentry, and there's only so many per district. And that speed sentry gets put out once it's your turn, and the cables go out, and you may not see the machine on all the time. Sometimes it'll get cut on, but it's, it's for study purposes. But now you're saying that I just made all that up? Like, please. The way I understand it, uh, council members, is the speed sentry, the one that comes up with the number, uh, the uh, miles per hour, that's also for counting volume and counting speed. It does go off at a certain period where it also continues to collect data. That's true. Now, what he's speaking of, we also have where uh, when you're trying to uh, check on for speed humps, they go out there and they collect volume. I don't know if they collect speed, but I do know they collect volume within the neighborhood to see how many, because, you know, the, the ordinance requires us to have so many vehicles to cross the little line there to, de to help decide if this area is eligible for uh, a speed hump. So they are two different ones. So they're not using conjunction, they're two separate things? I mean, can you clarify that? Uh, yes, and I don't want to put them on the spot, but Chief Braden, uh, Speed Century is y'all's department, yes? Day, all of that yeah. that we could make available to traffic services upon their request, but we don't do that on a regular basis. So your ability to, um, your ability to decide whether or not uh, area is meeting the threshold requirement for speed bumps can be completed simply with the tubes. Correct? Yes. And that happens more often than not. So we don't have to wait on a speed sentry to become available to, to conduct a study. Correct. Okay. It just so happened that every once in a while we use both just because? Uh, we can go that route, yes. Uh, it's just a matter of resources and timing. Okay. So if they're available, then we get additional data just sort of to get it? Or what was the determination whether or not it's utilized? Uh, if a speed sentry happens to be on a requested road and... Okay. That is just, it's a matter of timing. Uh, yeah, you're next. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to respond, DJ, to uh, Councilman Benevente, and I wanted to give him some clarity. Uh, I have a community of Robin Hill that has one way in, one way out, that has a lot of speeding. So I asked our chief, which is Captain De Jesus, down at Cross Creek, could he put out a speed sensor? Well, they have already done the study, which has authorized them to get speed humps. But well, the speed sensor is just speed sensor. It's just a deterrent to get people to slow down, which they can also use to help them with the data to get them speed humps, which they were already qualified for. So that's the difference between the two. One is 
You're not using it as a deterrent? Well, they're using it for speeding, too, but once people see it, they have a tendency to slow down. Let me just put it that way. I just wanted to add that, Mr. Mayor. So a lot like ahead, Shot Spotter, the speed centuries tell us what time of day we should be in an area. Chief, we're trying to get out of here before next Tuesday. <laughs> it tells us what, what times of day we need to be in the area because it collects all that data and said our highest traffic volumes are at this time, our highest number of speeders are at this time. Yeah, that was a good one. Good. All right, Chief. Mmm. <laughs> all right, Councilman over here. <laughs> I, have a, I have a handful of more slides here. All right, wait, wait. Councilman over here had a question. Well, no, I mean, I want to. Okay, Maybe. all right. So let's, let's let him finish, y'all, and then we'll hold the rest of them. Okay. All right. Mm. So, I do. I do have recommendations here, and well, suggestions, and I do have a handful more slides. So, let's get into it. And some of my information got a little bit cut off here. So, uh, hopefully, it shows up on y'all's information. If not, I can provide this information at email. Uh, but historic data here, uh, you can see the number of non-compliant and compliant inf information across all of our uh, speed study program. And the way to read this table, if it's not clear here, um, in 2019, we did, performed 102 speed studies. Of those 102 speed studies, five of those studies were on roads where the speed limit was above 25 miles an hour. This could be done for a number of different reasons, whether it was done because we had to review information because the development was coming in or we're reviewing a, a traffic safety issue uh, related to crashes. Uh, another... Uh, but one of the, some of the reasons that the state would be kicked out or one of the reasons that a road would be kicked out because it's not compliant is because of low ADT, which is annual daily traffic, a.k.a. the number of cars that drive down the road. They didn't meet the threshold or it has low speed. They didn't meet the threshold for speeding on that road. But oftentimes, and you'll see this kind of going across the board here, is low ADT and low speed, meaning there's, that road did not have a lot of cars and it didn't have high enough speeding on that road. Uh, in total, though, in 2019, 83 uh, speed studies were non-compliant, meaning of those 83 studies, those roads, those studies, they would not rise to the occasion of qualifying for a speed hump. Saying in 2019, though, uh, five speed humps successfully went through the non-compliant process and were installed across four different roads meaning one road had two speed humps installed, the rest of them got one. So they went through the non-compliant process of whether the HOA or the community got together, banded together, got the petitions together, paid out of pocket, and got them installed, or they petitioned city council, and then city council told us to go out there and install it. But five speed humps got installed across four roads. Staying in 2019, and I'm only going to do this for 2019 because it basically goes for, it stays like this for all the roads here. But 2019, uh, 11 roads or speed studies qualified for a speed hump. But staff were still waiting for a citizen to come back to us with a petition filled out. If you go down to 2020, 2021, there's eight roads that qualified and 11 roads that qualified. But citizens saw us come back to us with petitions. We were just waiting on the citizens to come back. We're just waiting. But... Going back to 2019, uh, eight of those studies that came back with petitions filled out saying, we want the speed hump, the community wants the speed hump, we said, yay. And then four speed humps were installed across two roads. And just to get ahead of this, if the numbers aren't making sense here, uh, if, eight, if we received eight petitions but four speed humps were installed across two roads, it's because if we receive a petition in, say, December 20th, we can't go install a speed hump on Christmas. We have to wait until the next calendar year. So what we receive late in the calendar year, we'll install at the beginning of the next calendar year. But that is how a lot of the information that you'll see here on the screen is read. Now, speaking of the petitions, and it kind of shows up very small on the screens here, but hopefully you guys can see it on your screen. Again, I can provide this information to you guys in email. The online petitions that we have, or the petitions that we host on our website, we have 34 active compliant petitions, meaning 
34 roads qualified for speed humps. And we said, citizens, go out, collect the signatures, and oh, by the way, we'll host the petitions on the website too, so, so your community can go and sign up online as well, saying, yes, we want speed humps. Of those 34, 20 of them have no signatures online. This information does not reflect the paper petitions held by the contact person. So I just want to make sure everyone's clear on that. This information doesn't reflect that. Uh, the highest percentage, though, is the petition for Fern Creek Drive, which is sitting at 28%. Uh, this is the online petition data for compliant. This is five active non-compliant petitions, which we also host. And of these, we have five. But now we're getting uh, away from what we have and kind of where we're going. We did a peer study, and we looked at what other North Carolina municipalities are doing. We looked at 18 of them, and six of them don't either have a defined threshold or process, or they don't even allow speed humps in general. 12 of them have a defined threshold. And of those 12, you can see their thresholds on the screen here. We are in line with what Apex, Cary, and Raleigh have. Other municipalities, like Concord and Gastonia and Wake Forest, they have a higher threshold than we do. The only one that has a lower threshold than us is Asheville. Based off what we saw from what other municipalities were providing, this is something that uh, we are bringing to council, saying, council, this might be something to consider uh, for revising to the signature process for the RTMP. Uh, first, we suggest that we continue going with the 70% signature requirement for the threshold just staying in line with what all other municipalities are doing. Uh, we also su suggest keeping the 100% acceptance for the immediately adjacent households to speed humps. Some of the possible revisions, though, and this is, again, based off of what we saw other municipalities do and provide, uh, is there were 18 peer-reviewed cities. Six of them had approval deadlines. We have 34 active open petitions right now, and 20 of them have zero, uh, zero signatures. So, online. hmm? Online. 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 So, uh, could it be possible that maybe a deadline be placed on some of these petitions? However, that again would be up to the purview of council. Uh, something that is not clear cut or it isn't right now allowed in the RTMP is to allow HOA boards to replace the signature thresholds for communities or essentially sign in place of the communities. What I'm, that means is an HOA board can come together and uh, write a letter saying we approve of the 70% signature threshold or something along those lines and hand it in and basically skip that 70% threshold uh, benchmark, that hurdle. On the community engagement part, um, Right now, we do not lay out any yard signs on the study area focus street, alerting the community to the study area. Right now, it's all on the contact person to do all of the alerting to the community, saying that this is going to be a, a speed hump street. Uh, we are suggesting that we start embracing kind of a notification to the community for this. Uh, and then one that, well, uh, one that I, <laughs> this is one for council. I would be kind of supportive of this one. Um, mailers being sent out to the study area with a prepaid return envelope and an RTMP ballot card, essentially removing the contact person from going around collecting the signatures and instead sending it out and putting it in the mailbox of the study area and having the mail come back to us. Uh, and then there's also, and there's only one place that does this, if I've read it right, and it's Raleigh. Um, investigate kind of a fast track, uh, but I need to kind of look into how defined this process is. And I have an example for this. It's Mirror Lake Road. But essentially, there's kind of a fast track in the, uh, the Raleigh and their version of the RTMP, where if a handful of residents that live on the street say yes, then it doesn't matter what the rest of the study area say, they get the speed hump. That's... If a handful of residents that live on the study area say yes, like a certain percentage of them say yes, it doesn't matter what the rest of the study area says, they get the speed hump. Okay, 
for the adjacent, like if you live at the speed hump, yes. But I have an example for it. I'll, I'll walk through it here. I'll walk through it. So before you go past that, he's, he's talking about the proposal. But you said you get ready to walk through that. The signatures on both sides of the street, which they're at four, where the speed hump is going to go. You're going to speak to that now? Not that part. What I'm talking about is the 70% threshold. Yeah, I got you on that. But I that, thought you said something about there was you get ready to tell us something about, you know, where the speed hump goes. And if there are house, houses on both sides of the speed hump or if it's one that's different, that both of those residents on both sides of the street have to sign that they accept the speed hump going in front of their home. That's not what you're speaking of. Correct. Right now, we still Right now, we still suggest and support <clears throat> keeping that at 100% acceptance okay. and not suggesting a way to get around that. Okay. We're suggesting kind of a way to get around that 70% signature threshold. Okay. And I have an example okay. to kind of talk about okay. the, an example that I believe Raleigh does. Waiting for so, Mirror Lake Road. Mirror Lake Road, the study area for Mirror Lake Road, has 88 houses. Right now, today, all right, let me rephrase this. The study area for it has 88 houses. Our study area says of those 88 houses, 62 signatures are needed to accomplish 70%. Right now, our online petition shows one signature. However, Mirror Lake Road has 31 houses inside of the study area on Mirror Lake Road. 50% or greater of 31 houses is 16 houses. So if 16 houses, if 70% of them said yes, that would be 12 houses. So if 12 houses on Mirror Lake Road said yes, that would result in a speed hump being installed on Mirror Lake Road. But it had to be the 12 that are inside the study area, and it had to be the ones that live at that speed hump as well. Plus the, two, the signatures on both sides of the speed hump. Yes, it has to be the ones that live at the speed hump and at least 12 on Mirror Lake Road. Now here's, here's a kicker on this. The more that live on Mirror Lake Road and send that back the ballots, or if we go with the mail-in ballots, if that's council's directive, the more that send in the ballots that live on the, um, the road, the higher that number gets. And I'll, I'll use simple math here. Say 100 houses lived on the road, and you needed a 70% threshold to say yes then you need 70 houses or you need 70 houses to come back and say yes but if 80 of them nope I already did my math wrong 100 houses live on the road at least 50% plus one house come back so 51 houses come back 70% of those 51 houses say yes But if 60 houses come back, you need more houses to say yes now. But if 70 houses come back, you need more houses now. If 80 houses come back, it's just the more houses that come back, the more houses have to say yes. So. Correct. Again, that's if council went with a the mail-in ballot type issue. So. Uh, so that is sort of a fast track example that may be a possibility uh, if I understood the Raleigh example correctly um, but again I don't want to steer anybody wrong but uh, those are some possible revisions to the RTMP uh, from there I do want to open it up to council questions council direction council All right. recommendations Councilman Benavente no, sir. oh here He's, what? Not, he's not even on here. Yeah. I've been waiting. <laughs> yeah, he's on. Okay. All right. Now, thank you. And I think you've done some great, great work. Uh, before I move forward, tell me uh, uh, into the minutes our present speed hump cost right now. One, one speed hump. On average, it is between $33 and $3,500. Correct. Correct. Okay. 
33 to 3,500. Now, I like this. I like uh, keeping, uh, I will be supporting keeping uh, the threshold at the 70%. Um, I like also the 100% acceptance. I think that works great. I also like, I'm not sure which one it is because it's not loading on my, my uh, computer here. But you had one stating about the um, the mellers. I really, really like that to help get the residents engaged. I really like that with a response. Okay. Now, before I go any further, I just wanted to go back to what I shared with my colleagues earlier today. And maybe you all can come back to us with some costs. Now, uh, what I sent to council, I think, early this morning was the, the smaller speed hump, which thank you for sending it back to us, um, Ms. Roden. Um, that's over at the university. Now, you, you, you said that you did not like that because is screwed, mounted down in, and then you said that the upkeep and the life of it, or the life, the upkeep is more, and the life of it is about five years, okay? Which I know I've been running over these at the university longer than that because I talked with them today about it, the police department. So they do last longer than that, and they've got a whole lot more movement sometimes it's inside of a neighborhood. What my interest would be, and I hope that my, my colleagues would consider it, if we go to the smaller speed hump, even if it has to be asphalt, okay, because we're trying to cut down the cost uh, of it, I would like for us to consider, at least you all to come back, making that speed hump smaller closer to the one that's in the email, like I said, my stuff is not showing right now, but that smaller one. And uh, I would like for us to consider, because all of us want the drivers to slow down in the neighborhoods. And even though quite a bit, according to the police, a lot of times the, the, the drivers are the neighbors, the ones that live in the neighborhood. But regardless of that, we, we want that to change. I want to put 200000 in the coming up budget discussion for speed humps. Our people want them. Our residents want them. We can keep talking about it and shifting it. And we still, we don't get anywhere. I like these new uh, concepts here. But I would like for us to see what the cost would be to make it smaller, for example, and if that's something that can be accepted uh, through what, whatever the, the organization, you know, whatever it is, or the department is called, uh, and if that's something that can be done on residential streets. Uh, I would like for us to consider that. The same thing that I shared within the, the, the email today, and I'll be more than happy to share it with you all. Um, and so that's where, that's, that's where I am. Um, I want to increase the budget. I know I'm reaching high, but I'm, I'm putting it out there. We see where it lands. But I'm asking for 200000 uh, for speed humps for our communities. And uh, I like these. I like bullet one. I like bullet two. And wherever the, whichever one is about the signs, uh, the Meller, I like that. And also, us using the signs just like we do for rezoning cases, so to, to, so that the people will, uh, and that'll be our part in helping instead of just depending on whoever brought it to the community to get out there and do the, the boots on the ground and things along that line. That's my request. So, Council Member here. Uh, if I can make one counterpoint on this. Um, all right. So you, you've seen the email about 
the concerns that I brought about uh, the, the smaller speed yes, hump sir. on this. Yes, sir. Um, so one of the things that I am trying to do is identify and bring about uh, areas where we can implement speed cushions. And speed cushions are there to alleviate some of the emergency response concerns that are brought about with speed humps mm -hmm. and speed bumps. Yeah. Now, speed cushions do have a bolt down uh, feature, bolt down option, however you want to phrase it. But they do have a bolt down version. Charlotte has been using them. Raleigh has been using them. However, they have moved away from them and moved into asphalt because of the concerns that I have brought okay. about I that. I like that because that's what I was introducing. I don't have a problem with that, but because of what I read within the, my, the response email, I didn't come out and just say that now. Uh, I like the bolted down, um, and the, the, fire, the uh, fire department's issue was that the water tank, I think that's what it is, is that's so low, would you know, issue whenever they cross over the speed hump. But you're talking about a speed hump that's about what, three or four inches tall, about five or seven inches wide, the ones that I showed earlier. I mean, I think that's a win-win, uh, and, and, and I'm ready for us to do something and stop talking our folk down because they're not getting anything. Right, and so I think, uh, thank you for that. Yes, uh, certainly the, the university uses it, I heard that, and we would love to be able to investigate that, but without having further data to support um, the dynamics of that particular speed hump. I'm not sure if it's a standard industry practice for a residential or a commercial street, one that's used for public transportation. Uh, staff would not be recommending it until we further investigated the applicability and the design features of the smaller speed humps and whether they're used by our peer cities and cities our size. Okay, what was the um, point having, that he mentioned, though? He yes. was talking about speed cushion. I think I was hearing you talk about some smaller speed humps that are of lower height. And I thought sooner. the speed cushion was something about that size. Yeah. Okay. No, sir. Go ahead. And so that's number one. And number two, I think part of our presentation was to enlighten council to understand that the dynamics is that we're not getting enough petitions. So our petition numbers are at 1% or 15% or 20%. And so the limiting factor has not been cost. I mean, there is cost, and that's why we put speed humps. But the budget has always been enough, or we have been able mm -hmm. to find the budget to build the speed humps that are requested that we have the appropriate signatures. The challenging part has been to receive the number of signatures to do the work. Right, and I agree with you on that. Um, I'm going to go a little bit sideways from you on Okay, we have two people budget. waiting. Mm -hmm. and we, we've got two people, okay. so let, let's All kind right. of <laughs> – the passion is there, okay. I see. Okay, guys. <laughs> but All you right. can go ahead, but, yeah. I mean, just I, make I was, it rounded out. Yeah, well, you know, this is my first, this is my first round. Um, but, okay, <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll, let other, I'll let other members. We'll go I'm with just that. saying that we've been talking about this for so long. <laughs> And we have gotten nowhere. Either the, the community doesn't qualify or we don't have enough of signatures or they cost too much or you pay half, we pay half. So, so it's always been something. I'm trying to get this. So, Council Member here, what yeah. I'm hearing, and I'm going to go straight to you, Council Member Benavente. What I'm hearing, and I hear it a lot in my district, too, because everybody, yes, wants, everybody wants a speed bump yeah. until they get it. And then they start thinking about it. Some of them do, some of them don't. So the signatures, yeah, I, I think, is the complaints. issue. But I'm going to go to Council Member Benavente. Yeah, I think we could put $10 million towards speed humps. That, that's not the issue here if people aren't completing the signature portion. So saying $200,000 you know, might sound good to the neighborhood to make it seem like we're doing something, but it's not actually addressing the issue. So I, I don't think we need to discuss the budget right now. I like um, community engagement because what I, what I did not understand about the online percentages is that how are most people in the zone going to even know that a petition is going on to then even know that something is available online for them to sign? Like the only way people are finding out to even do the petition is because someone knocked on their door and said to do it. So that's why I'm not totally convinced about you know the ver like the ver why it matters that only one percent of people have done anything online. I don't think anyone would know about it unless someone knocked on the door. So that's why I do appreciate your point about uh, mailers. Um, I think that's probably the strongest one. I, I, don't, I don't know about the HOA or the um, deadlines. I don't think those are bad ideas. Um, 
but but the community engagement one I think is the one I can appreciate. Can you go back to the questions and answers? I think it was the second slide, the second set of questions and answers, and you talked about um, right there. Uh, one more. Are there other alternatives given to communities besides a speed hump? Um, I, I think that you, you kept kind of turning the answer to that more into um, we just don't do it. And that, that's, I get that we don't do it. Um, I'm saying that if we can establish pr um, thresholds and standards for speed bumps because they're the most cost effective, because they're the most efficient, because of all the good reasons that speed humps are the Goldilocks you know, option, there are some more premium options. There are some more expensive options that are going to cost a lot of money. But I think when people have that context, they recognize that maybe speed humps are the most affordable, most you know, Goldilocks option. But when we don't have that additional context, potentially, and people are saying they want permanent speed centuries put in, they want you know, a tree planted in the middle of the street, when you give people that option, I feel like there is a way for folks to say, well, we can't get that many signatures or we can't pull that much money together. Let's be very, very satisfied with our, with our speed bump. Um, so I'm still trying to understand what the, um, like, like it's like we won't even look in that direction of alternatives because people do want options. Because as Councilmember Hodger said, maybe speed bumps isn't the best thing for every neighborhood. When are we going to kind of give that power back to the community to say what they want? And what's the harm in that, especially if the answer ends up being speed bumps because that's really the most logical or viable option? All right. Uh, so whenever it comes to the other traffic calming measures, especially things like roundabouts or uh, things like chicanes, uh, the level of... Chicanes? What was that? Chicanes. Uh, it's whenever uh -huh, you essentially okay, you. you have a road like this and then you take it and Heard. you turn it into like a spaghetti noodle. Um, but essentially, um, the level of engineering that goes into designing those and then providing cost estimates and then coming back to the community, there, there's not kind of a one-size-fits-all type of uh, uh, ability to provide that to a community. The, the level of variability to a lot of these elements it's sort of a unique situation that comes to a lot of the traffic calming measures that were provided in that presentation from a while back. Uh, the uniqueness, well not uniqueness, one of the benefits of a speed hump is that it is very much a cookie cutter solution sure, to uh, the, the speeding problem that a lot of communities have. And so that's why a speed hump has kind of that cost component that can be quoted off the top of the head. But whenever it comes to something like a roundabout, you can't just kind of cookie cutter, copy paste sure. it from one road to another. But I, I think you can incorporate that cost. If you're going to say that, listen, you can take option A, the speed bump, or option B, it's going to start with us having to do an analysis, and that analysis is going to have a cost associated, right? You know, it, again, it's still giving people the, the opportunity to decide whether that's best for their neighborhood. So I hear you that it might be more time consuming. They might you can get a speed bump in the next three or six months, or they can go through this couple years long process, right? But people are going to get what they want if that's the road they decide to go down. So I guess, can we make some kind of comment today to direct the RMTP to at least look into that? you know, what that would look like? So I do have an answer on this. You're not going to like it. That's all right. That's what we're talking. Uh, SS4A is coming back in a year. Yeah. And they're going to come back with su uh, suggestions about how to revise the RTMP based off the peer review studies. Mm -hmm. And the peer review studies are going to be doing... So as part of the peer review that we did for providing responses to this, I did kind of glance at what some of the other uh, localities are doing. I do believe Greensboro, Winston-Salem, places like that, they are doing like neighborhood uh, holistic reviews, things that basically come back and they say, hey, instead of this, let's also look at speed humps, traffic circles, medians, things of that nature. They also go through an entire project ranking scheme that would basically reinvent the wheel for our RTMP that would potentially come out of the SS4A or require an outside study, not something that staff can do based off of our capabilities and our workload right now. And so that would be something that SS4A would come back with recommendations in a year whenever SS4A concludes. Okay, well just keep that in the overall thing, right? Options, 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 options are a good thing. And then maybe the last question is, if we end up getting 
a lot of feedback. Like we start sending the mailers, we start putting out the signs, and all of a sudden people's petitions are getting completed. And all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're getting a lot more speed humps in places. Is there an addition to the budget that has to come when it comes to repaving? Like all of a sudden, you know, a street that would have gotten repaved for this cost now has to have it repaved and the speed hump removed and replaced. So, or, yeah, then I can, I can speak. so it's one of the things that we had. So we certainly have uh, some considerations for you to think about. And we certainly want to take back the mailer's suggestion if that's council's direction. Oh, However, okay. we would have to come to council and discuss cost involved with mailers. As you can see, there are so many petitions that are coming through. Sure. And the cost of mailing to all of the citizens around those communities is going to be increasingly more with time. And so we have to come back and do some sort of analysis with cost as it relates to mailers. We wanted to open up the discussion in this meeting as a first uh, response, and we'll wait on what direction is and come back with more resources need, resource needs as it, re as it relates to the mailers. Well, but now, what about repaving and the cost for, you know, we get to the point now that speed humps are getting completed for however method, we, they're just happening more often. Is there going to be an increasing cost to our ability to repave things? So, or is it difficult to determine right now? So the cost for repaving a street and uh, essentially refreshing a street, that is something that it, in the grand scheme of things, it might increase incrementally. However, it, it you know you're, you're talking millions uh, for the entire program that it's it's small money. Understood. Okay. Well, that, that's good. That's that's one less thing to worry about then. Um, I just just I think I think the costs have to go back to the community. If we're saying that the mailing uh, both you know return mail thing is is an option, there's option A. You do it yourself. You knock your doors. Um, but if you're going to get the mailers part portion of it, again, there may be a cost uh, associated with, with that the same way right now that there's a cost associated if you don't meet the threshold. Maybe if you meet the threshold, then we will give you the pay postcards. But if you don't meet the threshold, you still want it, maybe you have to pay for the postcards too. I don't know. They're, just share the costs, you know. Just... I, so did we get, did you get your questions answered? Yeah, I guess. Are we good? Okay. Councilmember Banks McLaughlin. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I definitely like the, the Meller option um, because I have an area um, in Cliffdale West who they've been approved to receive um, the speed humps. However, they're having issues with getting it um, signed. Um, so my first question is, where would they, um, that community life, they hadn't had the petitions, it's already been approved. Is the money kind of allocated for that, or would they go all the way to the bottom? Is it kind of like first come, first serve as far as? Um... So there's two ideas on this. Um, the first one would most likely be first come, first serve, and that would be something that we would probably define and bring back to council whenever we uh, more, more thoroughly kind of outline and establish what the millers would look like and what the program would look like. Uh, the second one, this would also come down to um, something that I'm getting a sense is not being supported by council, although please correct me. It would come down to potentially the deadlines and returning of those mailers. Um, because if the mailers aren't returned within a deadline, then it sort of becomes a situation of how long is the mailers going to be active. Okay. And also with the, with the mailer can... Um you guys consider putting a QR code on there, which that can go straight to you guys versus, I mean, at least letting them have that option, rather uh, mailing it back or just using a QR code, which will go straight um, through the system. Um, in a second, just for the listening audience, um, renters have the opportunity to fill out these petitions also, correct? Not just owners. Yes. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, um, Council Member. So I guess um, what I will say is I, I have I've been very fortunate that my district has gotten quite a few of these speed humps. Some of them like them, some of them don't. But I I will say I believe in a deadline because everybody sitting here knows when everything is going well in your district, it's very hard to get people to come to an HOA meeting. 
But when things become a problem, your HOA meetings are filled. So if there's a deadline, it, hopefully it will get them there. Just my opinion. So with that being said, um, do we need to take action on this? I'm sorry, I did not see it. I, I do, and I did not see that. I apologize. Um, Council Member Hondras, I apologize. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. So my comment is in regards to the mailers. So the mailers don't have to be a stuffed envelope. They could just be a little postcard. And um, I'm okay with the um, with a deadline um, because we don't necessarily need to keep cases open indefinitely. But I'm kind of confused with um, leaving the mailer portion of it open. To me, I don't know that we necessarily need to do mailers where we mail out where they can sign the petition and mail that back. To me, the mailer, which is why I say a postcard and a QR code is perfect, also a web address where people can go online similar to a rezoning case where they can get the information so they can pull up the QR code or pull up uh, on the website, put the case in and see what's going on. We talked about signage. Um, in neighborhoods where a potential speed hump is going to go with a case number. So they put the number in, they're like, okay, let me see the backup information. Okay, my neighbors want to put, uh, or there's a proposal to put a speed hump in my neighborhood. You can vote, I support it or I don't support it. It doesn't have to be where the um, mailer has returned postage for them to act through the mail. You know, it's just a direction, informative where they can go online to vote and be done with it. I think a little postcard would save, it'd probably be a third the cost of stuffing envelopes with a return request. So that's all I got. Thank you, Council Member Hondras. Um, well, no, we're gonna go to Council Member Thompson and then I will come back to you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I just want clarity and I agree with everything that was said so far, but uh, as far as your items up there, one is I don't believe that we need a deadline under the current system. That's right. Now, if you use this system, and I'm going to read it to you for the mail-in ballots, whether it's a postcard or whether it's a QR code, it should be a deadline because it should be a yes or no option. It should be returned or assumed to be no if it's not returned, and the ballot should be accepted within 60 days once it's mailed to you. So I agree with all that that everybody else has been said. Uh, uh, as far as the HOA, we should, and I'm an HOA previous president. We don't give HOAs that much power over that many residents without knowing that they informed their residents prior to making a great decision like this. Uh, as far as speed humps, I think we should keep the current speed humps that we have. And as far as uh, funding, I think this should be just like the uh, demolition. I think there should be unlimited funding as long as we know that the cons uh, constituents are doing this process to make sure they get approved because we have and I asked you this question before how much money has been used this year none how much money was used last year none so we have we don't know how much we're gonna use next year so we have three years of funding that we can make up to give all the speed humps that's necessary in this entire city so thank you for the presentation and you look a lot more comfortable up there this time than you did last time Thank you, Councilmember Thompson. Um, I'll look to you, Councilmember Hare. Yeah, so but I just want to make sure I'm understanding uh, as far as all the council goes. So um, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to be making a motion that um, the staff recommends option one to revise the RTMP to adopt a signature collection process through Mellers and what was the code, the Zoom, the QR code, the QR code um, to be outlined and presented and to allow HOA boards, did you say, what did you say on that? No, but I want to get agreement with it so we can have it done. We don't have to go no, back I'm, and make I'm another. Take that out. Okay, then I will um, uh, move <clears throat> that the staff recommends option one to revise the RTMP to adopt a signature 
uh, collection process with the, uh, the code through mailers as an outline in the presentation period. Yes, yes. Can I get a second? Yes. That's what? Investigate and return with more defined process regarding Pierce City. The investigate was the fast track thing. So that's been done? The fast track thing was the whole Mirror Lake Road example of you live on the road and so many houses were turned. So do I have, do we have any discussion? Correct. Right. Right. So we're just taking out, just taking out the, just taking out the okay. H. Um, okay. So any discussion? Okay. I'm calling for the vote. That's it. Thanks, Council. One more. Yeah, but it don't matter. It will. Somebody has to vote. Okay. All right. Yes, the mayor had to go pick up um, his children so they can come into town to vote. So he had to go. All right, so let's go to 6.08. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, I will go to Council Member Banks McLaughlin and let's get the clock going. And. And if you want to leave time open for the chiefs here, you need him. I'll try to leave him. Yeah, I'll try to leave him. Yeah. I'm ready whenever you are. Yeah, okay. Um, council, please. Um, council Member Banks McLaughlin. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as many of you know, I serve on the Governor's Crime Commission. Um, by being on that commission, one of our missions is to enhance the public safety and reduce and prevent crimes um, by improving the criminal justice and safety in our community. Um, over the last years, um, we have experienced an uptick with, um, they call it DIY, do-it-yourself gu ghost gun kits. Um, these are items that are, um, people put them together to build guns. Uh, these guns are untraceable. Um, they don't they don't require a background check, um, nor serial number, a cell of record, or any other protections. Um, in 2022, uh, the Biden administration um, took a, an executive action to address the gun crisis um, at a federal level. Um, as many of you know, we have to um, take it to a more comprehensive um, legislative to get a better response, um, such as the con Congress and as well as our the state house. Um, the gun ghost, the ghost gun industry has developed um, the kits related projects. Um, just like I mentioned, they're um, untraceable. Um, a lot of people are getting their hands with um, with the guns. They're untrained amateurs, um, quickly assembling these firearms. Um, without the serial number, uh, law enforcement cannot run a trace to search on these firearms, and it's also making it difficult, if not impossible. Um, pro roughly about 14 states um, have this, um, this regulation um, as it relates to the ghost guns. Um, our Attorney General Stein um, has joined with uh, 24 other um, attorney attorneys um, to try to help out and assist with this matter. Um, other states who have um, filed the complaint or regulated, they have reported that there has been an increase um, with uh, crimes that's in an area related to the ghost guns. Um, there has been multiple jurisdiction who has shown a drop in ghost gun recoveries as well. Um, ha it has taken effect in 2023. As of now, um, our state uh, does not regulate these ghost guns. So I am requesting that my colleagues um, send a resolution up to the state um, to support uh, background checks, serial numbers, seller record, and other protection um, as it relates to purchase of ghost guns. And I'll hold my time just in case anybody have any questions. Thank you. So does anybody have any questions? Ghost gun. You have to build a ghost gun. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. You they build them mm -hmm. with through different parts, and they're untraceable because there's no um, serial numbers attached to them. So anybody can go online and purchase and build these weapons. So if if uh, oh, the chief would like to come up and speak, mm -hmm. and and then oh, thank you. So I go. So I think uh, the only thing I'd like to speak about is just clarify what it actually is. You know, uh, and, and the councilwoman asked about our, our seizure of ghost guns over the past several years, and it has. It's gone up like a thousand percent because the technology to 3D print receivers, which are the serialized portion of a gun, you know, is just now making its way out to the general public where they have that capability to print those things. So imagine like a car. You could buy a car without a motor. It's still a car. You still have a VIN number on the car, but it doesn't run until you put the motor in it. That's what ghost guns are like. They're building a gun with a frame that has no serial number, but they're taking parts from other guns, 60, 70, 80 percent builds, and putting those on unserialized receivers, which they print off 3D printers and things of that nature. So again, uh, much like the councilwoman said, there's no serial number of that. It, to, to legally purchase a weapon or a firearm, you have to go through and, and, and have that serialized portion and, and, and run your background checks to get those things done. Uh, uh, hold on, hold on. Councilmember McNair's next. Uh, no, I brought it to the chief. Uh, well, we're gonna we're gonna take his time and act like it didn't happen. So, um, council member, were you done? No, I just wanted to know was that the ask just to send the proclamation up to the state? Well, the, a, resolu a resolution of support, yes, to the gotcha. to state and gotcha. federal. Yes. Gotcha. Council member McNair, uh, I had a question about the background check. Um, how do you do a background check on a ghost gun? Uh, and, and again, did you the, mention a background check? The, there, there's oh, not you say one. They don't. They, oh, okay. I thought you said they have to do a background. I misunderstood you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a what I was saying. Any other questions? I'll second. The ask is for a resolution to our federal and state partners for them to look at regulating these guns. Thank you. Okay. I got a second. I'll call for the vote. Um, we're missing someone. We need a vote. No, we are. We did not. Are we done? Okay. Motion to adjourn.